oh, okay. that has like a whole scaffold. We, we are live. We are, actually. Oh, we are? Yeah. History Studios, high atop Baltimore Street, in a maximum security facility complete with central air. It's AG Today. Hello, folks. It's Patrick Gorman. Hi, this is Jake Busey. Hi, this is Bruce Boxleitner. This is Tom Vera from A Gettysburg Christmas. Hi, this is Bo Brinkman. And you're listening to Addressing a Gettysburg. Gettysburg. I'm glad you're listening. Thank you. There's a devil to pay. <laughs> Did you say I think it? Oh, yeah. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bonfire. You are listening to the Bird Today. I love this podcast. Oh, exactly. Ooh, don't do it. Please don't do it. Oh, no. Oh, no. Really? Oh, my gosh. You know, oh, it's devastating. <laughs> I just hate you, and I hate your ass face. Dibbick schmibbick, I said more ham. Screw you guys, I'm going home. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg Today. AG Today, as the kids call it on the street. And, uh, man, today is uh, really a tough day here. We, we had a big show, all excited about it. All going to be a full house in here. We're going to have uh, Richie Condon coming in and, of course, Ronnie Ronstadt, the, uh, the co-host of Addressing Gettysburg. And then, like, within a half an hour, the half hour right as we were getting ready to, uh, to start, uh, you know, everybody's starting to show up and everything, I get a text from Ronnie, and she says that uh, she... She can't make it, and then I get a text from Richie saying he can't make it, and why? Because both of them... And you're going diarrhea. ...have <laughs> stomach issues, and so... <laughs> and so, um, yeah, and so they're not going to be able to make it in, and which has me worried, because uh, uh, now maybe there's something going around, and of course, I saw Rich last night, so did Colby, and so did our guest Peter Carmichael Pistol Pete Carmichael <laughs> and um, and so who knows now we're all going to come down with something and we have a big weekend ahead of us here mm -hmm. uh, Pete Carmichael welcome thanks yeah it's great to be back uh, put, put the microphone pointing to your mouth so that we can I hear guess. you please you hear yeah there you go right, perfect thank you very much and uh, yes it's good to have you back we had a fun time last night uh, Colby Debbie Jones is sitting in here as well um, hello everyone Colby uh, we had fun last night with uh, Pete and a, a whole array. It was like the who's who of Fun. Civil War people, right? Absolutely. To uh, celebrate Scott Hartwig's new book on Antietam. And uh, yeah, it was quite a gathering of folks. Scott said a few words about his book and uh, it was fantastic. We don't get together uh, for things like that. We should. Every no, time someone I, publishes a book, man, we should celebrate. We gotta have, yeah, people need to start writing more books so that yes. we can have these parties again because it was, it, was, it was cool because I, I didn't know who to expect. You know, I didn't really think about it. I was invited to it um, a couple of days beforehand, so I didn't have time to really think, oh, I wonder who's going to be there and all that. Mm. And then I walk in, and it's just like everybody is there. Jim Brumall was there. Jim Brumall was there. Chris was Gwynn super, was there. He was super interesting. It was my first time meeting Jim. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, oh, that's uh, right. I introduced you guys. Yeah, he, we, we had a really, really interesting conversation. I think uh, him and uh, he's got a friend that's a, a, a behavioral psychologist that also wrote a book oh. on... Um, like a, a soldiers from the Army of the Potomac after the war, uh -huh. post, you know, post war, and, and how kind of, I guess, the adjustment phase. Um, so we're going to have the two of them in to have a 
conversation, um, you know, relating to the topics of their books, because he did a, Jim did a study on the Confederates in, in a very sim, uh, a similar time frame. Yeah, yeah. I wish I knew about his friend with the the with the that book because that's something that interests me too. Well, but, when I I have hmm. I have his name here. I, I'll give it to you after the show. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, and and so Scott had a, a line last night that I I wrote. I had to write it down because it was really good. And it was about memory versus history. Do you remember? I, I did, yes. Um, now, I, I think I paraphrased because by the time I actually got my note app open, he had <laughs> moved did. on. You did. I was reading what you wrote. And it wasn't exactly. He had said it more eloquently, but by, I wish I had said, hold on a second, Scott. And then <laughs> so I got to say, say that again. Yeah. yeah. He, he was quoting Timothy Snyder, who is right. a historian at Yale, uh, and who writes of the Holocaust. He's a, just a brilliant historian. So, but it was basically quote. memory is history, but it's not. Memory is a disservice to history is essentially what he was saying. Because there's a difference between the two, but people often confuse them. Right. And I, and I think that's the, the problem with most well, of our I, lost causers. It is, it, it is, and I probably would just uh, give Scott a little pushback. I think that separation between memory and history is a little artificial. I mean, as soon as an event happens and one recalls it, it's, it's memory. memory so yeah. They're actually inseparable. And but I don't think that's what he meant, though. Well, I, I know, but I think that any attempt to try to separate the two then leads us to believe that there is a history out there that's recoverable. It's the truth, and we can find it, which I think, yes, there are certain things that are recoverable and that are indisputable. But I think it's a mistake to believe that somehow, some way, that when you start creating memories, that you're getting away farther from the truth of history. The truth of history is about how people make meaning of it mm. and how they make meaning of it over time, it changes. And okay. So f I'd focus more on that and why those meanings change. I think that's what's important rather than trying to say, look, I've discovered the truth and from there we see how people have sort of run with it. In many cases they have. Lost cause is a mm -hmm. good idea. Mm -hmm. I talked to my students uh, recently about the signs. You don't see as many now on the battlefield that are in the you know, you know where people live not on the battlefield but in people's homes it's a uh this place mattered here because black lives matter oh this mm. this battle was fought because yeah. black lives Absolutely. matter yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so how do you think my students felt about that side how do we think your, your students, students felt about yeah, it so Gageborough college right it's my survey civil war class mostly first year students we talked about the sign how do you think they think I hate well, it? Well, I would think imagine that's a good sign. That's I feel like they probably. Sign. I feel like I feel like they probably could connect with that. Yeah, I, th I, I figured agree, they would yeah. have liked it because yeah, your smile it, makes me think I'm wrong. It makes you feel good. <laughs> it's a feel good thing, but it's not. Every yeah. single student who spoke in a class of 25, there were 10 or 11, and every single student said that's not history at all. That's not true. That's not why they fought here. And that signs are there wow. to make people good. feel good for them. They don't, can actually think. I'm glad to hear don't that. Don't underestimate these young people. I, I did. That makes, I that totally makes, did. It gives me hope, man. Yeah. And yet at the same time, the point again is not to just say, hey, those signs are ridiculous. No. And they're there to make us feel good. As My point to them was, look, we always want to blame the far right for using the lost cause in all kinds of absurd and horrible ways, and that's true. But we should not forget that on the left, there's also a misuse and abuse of history as well. And again, it's our whole political system. Is well, oh my, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the point. The point, again, is that that's what I'm trying to say, and that would be my point to Scott as well. Like, well, they're, they're wedded, right? The, the, the two... The two themes are wedded history sure. and memory. Yes, um, and, there and you well, go. But like, it would be like trying to interpret the Civil War without giving any acknowledgement to the co the cause of the war. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. right. but, so, the, but, but the thing with memory, though, Pete, is that, you know, you talk about you know, memory is as soon as the thing's over and people start talking about it, they're, it's memory, it's their memory, right? Sure. But I don't think, I always took when people talk about memory in relation to history, they're talking about Almost, uh, for lack of a better word, like pop culture, like how mm -hmm. we popularly remember an event, which doesn't necessarily mean it is historically accurate. And I like how you've made that characterization. I Thank you. absolutely agree with you. If you were to say, hey, what's this popular interpretation of that? That's getting us somewhere. And then we'd have to be more specific about the time and the place and how all that changes. So, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. And one person, a historian of note, said that uh, memories in the gut – and history's in the head. As you can only imagine, that makes utterly no sense to me whatsoever, <laughs> right? Because history, go to an official report. If you go to the ORs, those reports, they're like kind of dry, right? Yeah, yeah. But are those not the memories? Hmm. 
Absolutely. Sure. Is there not some emotion that's an element of the recollection of those memories? Of course. Yeah. Right? So, again, the separation, like I said, I, I don't know where that gets us. I don't think it gets us very far at all. What I like to see is what my students did, right? Yeah. They looked at that and said, here's this expression about the Civil War. Why are people articulating their understanding of the war in this particular way? When the history, as they said, the Union soldiers who fought here were fighting mostly for Union, although they knew that now the cause of Union was the cause it's of It's been expanded. But yeah. it is interesting, though, because every generation uses the Civil War, or perhaps any area of history, but we study the Civil War, and they, they seem to use the Civil War and interpret it in a way that meets their modern-day political views or, or whatever. Um, and, and you can go back to every generation, and they all did it in their own way, you know? And that's what's so mm -hmm. frustrating because sometimes that becomes the history, right. Right. and then and then we and then now. But it seems like now that there's a really good crop of historians who are trying to like wipe away the dust of all that craziness over the last hundred and sixty years, and and reexamine it. You know, I mean, but by craziness I mean like the lost cause and just all the myths. And there's there's Yankee myths too. It's not all Absolutely. on the South, and. Um, and now people are kind of saying, well, let's wipe that away and, and see if we can't really get down to the nuts and bolts of what happened, which is, I like. Uh, uh, absolutely. And I, you know, I think now. And it's, but by the way, it's most on display at the CWI Summer Conference. <laughs> <laughs> it really well, is. That's where I realized this plug. last last June is I was like, you know, I'm like, you know what? It's like, this is a really good crop of historians that we have nowadays because people are looking at things differently and they're kind of wiping the, the soot of all the myths and legends they away. Are, they are, and I have to be very careful how I say this, especially uh, that we're live. Um, <laughs> we're also at a particular moment uh, politically uh, in the wake of the murder of, of George Floyd. I think that a lot of good history has come out of that. I think it's brought attention to historical actors that we've often pushed to the margins. All that's really important. My fear is, though, that in our attempt to, in a sense, recover the, the lost historical actors, that we've now pushed them to a place of prominence in which we don't see how historical actors of different backgrounds, different races, different classes, truly interacted. So, for instance, there's some excellent work that's been done on the abolitionist movement. And over time, we've not fully recognized the contributions of free blacks to that movement. And now we're at a point, though, where <laughs> their contributions seem to be the ones that only matter. And I, mm. I, I am mm. at a risk here. It's an overcorrection. Yeah. It, it is. And again, it, it is. I am very nervous and uneasy in making that kind of observation because, of course, as a white dude, I could easily be seen as a reactionary, which I am not. I just want to remind us again that... This is a perilous undertaking, as we all, as historians, and whenever I hear people like yourself who have an acknowledgement and awareness that, hey, you know, what's happening in the world around me today, that's a filter through which I understand the past, and I'm going to try to do all I can to try to keep that from happening, mm. although some of it is utterly unavoidable. Mm -hmm. So I can just do a little political thing for me, right, that I have to be careful of. Yeah. Right? It is hard for me to not get emotional and feel very strongly about what these Union soldiers gave their lives for. Sure. Mm -hmm. And their belief that the act of secession was an immoral and illegal act in which they were willing to give their lives to defend for the cause of democracy. It is hard for me not to bring that to the forefront of all my public talks because I want people to remember what happened on January 6th, which is an utter tragedy in this country's history. A tragedy. Just and as I, bad as 9-11? Uh, I don't even compare them because they're right. so radical. They're, 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 they're not even but, but you do hear people trying to make the comparison. But, but I would not make that comparison at all. But I would say that when you look at what happened at the Capitol and what was and what triggered it, and look, I don't understand how we don't have 80 to 90 percent of Americans saying, oh, my God, this was an attack on our institutions and it cannot be tolerated in any way, shape, or form. Just as these northern soldiers said, that firing on Fort Sumter— was a firing on our country's stand on republicanism and democracy and yeah. that we, we won't we won't allow that. We won't stand for it. And so, you know, I have to be careful because I know there are people in my audience who probably don't feel that way about January 6th. And, I think uh, the, the, the complicated thing about January 6th is you have to look at it in the context of the three or two, what was that, 21 or 22? That was 21. 
So you got to look at it the like year leading up to it, um, I, and not in a vacuum. Like it, it's not, it didn't happen in a vacuum. In other words, and and I think any uh, moment in history you have to look at that way. You can't just look at it. That's you got to look at what is it a part of? That's what right. is it a reaction to? Right. And, and yeah, but like, well, let's go to the 1860 election, right? So 1856 is the first time that the Republicans ran a candidate for presidency. It was John Fremont. And if you look at the letters of Southerners, many of them said, if Fremont, if he gets elected, we're done, we're out of this union. They were rattling sabers in 1856. We had the rattling of sabers from our president before that election. Mm -hmm. He said that if I lose this election, it's a false election, right? It, the, you know, it's, it's, it's not legit. So, you, you, like you said, yeah, there's warnings. These tremors are happening before. Yeah. They happened before 1860, man. Now, a lot of Northerners thought this was just a bunch of bluster on the part of Southerners and that cooler heads would prevail. But obviously, it's Four years. Well, you know, what's, what's interesting, though, is, is uh, the, the history of secessionist movements in our country prior to the Civil War, uh, which I didn't know about until very recently. And, I mean, none of them were as successful right. or big right. as the Confederacy. But it, we seem to be a nation of people who never really wanted to be together with the, you know what I mean? Like, we are, we're always trying to find an excuse to get away from each other. <laughs> and, and I think that's just as American I, as apple pie or anything I, I, else. I, I, like, every I, once in a while, we get fed up and we're like, yeah. I want to be away from you. Well, I think there are particular moments within very localized regions sure. in which there's that kind of dissatisfaction. But for the most part, and even in 1860, that there still was, even among Southerners, who certainly did not embrace secession but saw it as inevitable and lamented the fact that the nation was going to be dissolved. So uh, there is a strong sense of nationalism that's always united this country in positive and in negative ways. And, you know, as I tell my students, you know, there is a lot of ugliness with democracy and we see it all around us and we see it in our past. And rather than give up and, of course, give in to cynicism, man, there's a lot of moments mm -hmm. where democracy, we sort of rise up, we get out of the gutter, and we get clean. And I think the Civil War is one of those moments. It's yeah. hardly perfect. And this goes back to the presentism of today, the notion that if we came out of the Civil War and suddenly African Americans were not only free but enjoyed equality, and that the fact that they did not enjoy equality— that that somehow makes the war a failure and made Reconstruction a failure. Mm -hmm. I don't get that reasoning at all. That's, to me, ahistorical. That is a standard that we're imposing upon those people that fits us and not them. Yes. What happened at the end of 1865 was truly revolutionary. It was far from perfect, but those forces that were unleashed, who would have ever imagined it? You're going to tell me after John Brown's raid in 1859 that anyone could have imagined that there would have been black Soldiers for the U.S. government, right. former slaves, marching into Charleston, South Carolina, yeah. of all places. So, yeah. you know, I, like I said to my students, I think it's an important point. The past can be discouraging as hell. Don't let yourself go down that road too far because there's too many things that give us hope and encouragement. We don't need, I think, to disparage our country when we study the past. We need to be critical, and we need to know that all people across the globe— there's ugliness, oh. man. Because <laughs> it's it's all human yes, beings, and humans Always are ugly. It's more complicated than yeah, we like absolutely. to think. Absolutely. I, I, well, I prefer to look at our history as like, yeah, there are horrible things in it, and we don't have it anymore. Like, I'm very happy that I'm alive in, in a day and age where I don't have to, you know, go visit my relatives in Virginia and see slaves. Right, right. Well, it's, you know? it's from the dawn of America. From the is, dawn of America. It has been, it has been a constant effort to make the country live up to exactly yes. like live up to what was That's was right. set out. You don't flip right? a light switch and then uh, live up to the ideals of the Declaration no, like of Independence. Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, you know, writing the Declaration, and um, he he obviously was a slave owner, yeah. right? But he put in there that all men are created equal, and I think he did that intentionally. I don't think he specified what kind of men were created equal to others. You know, I, even though in even though at the time that he was living in, him being a slave owner, I still think he had an ideal in his mind regardless of the institution of slavery, that every man, you know, black, white, whatever color you want to think of, was created equal, and that from that moment to where we are now, we have strived continuously to live up to those standards that were set in that document. And um, it's one of the things that makes this country the greatest country that's ever been in, in, 
in the history of the unique experience. Kobe, I would just say this. I think Thomas Jefferson, when he wrote All Men Are Created Equal, he looked at that and he probably thought, damn, I wish I had some whiteout. Like, wait, <laughs> can someone give me some whiteout here? I, I really mean this. Why didn't anybody Why? invent some parchment out? I, I, God, I blew it, right? Yeah. Because I can tell you, man, the Southern slaveholders, I looked at that document and they thought, what was TJ thinking? Yeah. Right? What yeah. was he thinking there? Well, and I think but I agree with Kobe. This is an experiment, right? And it's a noble one. And we are always striving to live up to that. And we certainly can never do that. If we want to tell our young people, look at your past and just disparage, criticize, damn, condemn everybody. Man, I want people and my students to come out of a Civil War class and seeing that, yes, these individuals are human, but also to see these remarkable things that they did, the mm -hmm. sacrifices they yeah. made, the duty they had. And that's on both sides. Man, these kids aren't dumb. They know that the South fought for slavery, right? But they are also recognize that that's the world that they inhabited, and they want sure. to understand that world. So. Now, do, they, do you find, Pete, when they come in, that they have, you know, maybe a different type of view of the South, and then when they leave, it's changed? So I've taught in the South almost my entire career, and here at Gettysburg, um, yes. And I, that view they have of the South and of the North is the South is a land of sinners who brought the war on, <laughs> and that the North was committed to abolition and ending slavery. So it's not very nuanced. And listen, before everyone gets up in arms, history's not being taught anymore, which I just get so weary of hearing that. And the problem is, is the relentless testing that these high school students across the country are subjected to. They are standardized testing that does almost, almost never accounts for history. And you can't blame these teachers. They gotta prepare the kids for the test. They have no choice in the matter. Right. And the consequence of that is, is that they don't have a very broad, or even I should say more importantly, a deep view or deep understanding of the past. And yeah, it's a, it's a problem, but we'll get yeah. through it. We they have to, to keep everything have to. at surface level because they, they have to go for that test rather than the critical. Right, level. right. And just think about, you know, when you were in junior high, were you open to the nuances of what it meant to live in a slaveholding I couldn't society? spell nuance in junior <laughs> high. I don't even know what it means. I still don't even think I know what it means. I said epitome. Just, the word epitome. Yeah. I shouldn't embarrass that. I say this online. I didn't do this in front of a class, thank God. I was in college, though. I said, not epitome. I said, epitome. Oh, no. Epitome. And that man, my friends, <laughs> oh. never, ever, my high school friends, epitome this, epitome that. <laughs> that was your nickname. Epitome. Epitome <laughs> Carmichael. Yeah, epitome. A sign yes, you'd yes. only ever read the word and yeah. not actually heard I've never heard it. <laughs> right, right. Now I said this online, and guess what? I'll be hearing this now for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, uh, you want to take a call? From a listener who has a serious question, and we'll get to you, Colby, right, afterwards. I a, Sorry. I got a question related to that. All right. Uh, Dave, is that you on the air? Yep, I'm here. Hi, David. Go ahead. You've got Peter Carmichael, uh, Pistol Pete Carmichael. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, uh, should I call you Professor Carmichael, Dr. Carmichael? Pistol. Which would pistol. you prefer? All that. I actually pistol. prefer, okay, I prefer Pete. I do like Pistol. If I was on the basketball court, that's what they called me. I was a kid. I was from Indiana. I didn't play like Pistol, but I like that. Pete, uh, Pete is perfect. Pete's, Pete's I, just fine. Okay. Well, Pete, I have uh, two questions, and I will sign off after this, but I, I will preface this by saying I talked with Matt about sort of maybe doing a, a podcast called uh, Civil War Matters in the past. Oh, no. What? And, uh, hold on. Hold on. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Are, are, you, you, on speaker, you, are you on speakerphone? No, I'm on my uh, on my computer. Oh, gotcha. And, okay. Uh, However, you're wh you whatever proximity okay? you're talking to the microphone now is the clearest that you sound. So stay where you are and continue. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but no. So I had talked with Matt previously about maybe doing a podcast called Civil War Matters about how the Civil War still affects us, how we are basically still living in it. And it's not all good. And so my two questions are, uh, and I'll sign off after this. Uh, on January 6, 2021, the Confederate flag made its way into the, quote, people's house for the first time. 
Do you feel that the failure of reconstruction led to this event in some way? And secondly, um, why do we as a nation sort of pussyfoot around the lost cause so much? And how do we fix that? <laughs> yes, good point. Good okay. question. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, I, stay, Dave, stay on. Don't yeah. don't run off in case you want to continue. Yeah. I have okay. quick responses okay. to that. I, I thought that the uh, emphasis on the Confederate flag in the Capitol on January 6th was completely misinterpreted interpreted by our press and even by some of my colleagues who wanted to turn that into an event they tried to racialize that event what they were forgetting the protesters the insurgents who were they after you can't find a whiter man in america <laughs> than vice president penn that's who they were after <laughs> that's right right, right. So, uh, so the idea is look the confederate flag is meant in and uh represented a wide range of political interests most of them of course with 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 uh, the clan and with racism there's, there's no doubt about that but the flag also has represented a sense of rebellion taking it against the man i'm so that, glad you said that class base yeah and so the flag has meant a number of different things i thought again the explanation for January 6th and turning into a, like a racist event, even though the Proud Boys were there, we know what they stand for. There are probably some Klansmen there as well. But it goes back to the point. We have lost in this country an ability to have a complicated analysis of people's backgrounds and political agendas. We just reduce it to identity, yeah. identity, identity. And it again, it flattens who people, what they are. So yeah. that's my first point. The second point is, again, I, I'm sorry to disagree with you, but I think we have come so far when it comes to confronting um, the lost cause and its distortions. I see, again, I've been a historian for a long time. I started when I was 19 at Appomattox. You can't believe the stuff I heard mm -hmm. all the time. Man, Grant's nothing but a drunk. That's what they would say. And I listen, I'm not the brightest dude. I suddenly had an epiphany. I'm from Indiana, but I'm like, wait, what's going on here? Man, Grant won the war. Right. Here's where the nation supposedly healed at Appomattox. Why are all these people doing this? And I was dressed up as a Union soldier. They called me damn Yankee this, damn Yankee that, mm. which was, of course, in just a little bit. But by the end of the summer, man, I was getting touchy. So here's the <laughs> point. Right? Like, this is too much. <laughs> then, I, my, then I worked at Cold Harbor. Yeah. And there is this little visitor shelter there. It wasn't enclosed. It was worse than your old studio. That's what okay. I can imagine. It was that bad, man. No offense or wow. anything. Yeah, right? <laughs> Cold Harbor. So, and the Park Service at that time, they played upon Grant's disaster there in terms of the signage and the exhibits. I can believe it. I found myself defending Grant of all places at Cold Harbor. And this dude came in to this exhibit shelter and said to me, Ulysses S. Grant, he's never won anything in his life. Except said, the war. What? I said, I said, let's go outside. Of course, it wasn't to fight because 90% of the American male population can kick my ass easily. <laughs> but I went out and I pointed to the American flag and I said, he must have won something. We wouldn't be here right, right. now. So my point is, is that, yes, there's, I think, more rear guard actions when it comes to the lost cause. It will always be with us. But its prevalence, its strength, its popular cultural impact is so minimal compared to where it was but you can cherry pick anything and that is again one of the great challenges that we face because we have a media that absolutely thrives on controversy they thrive on mm. exceptionalism so and it's and it's disturbing because you mean sensationalism yeah absolutely it, it reminds me of what happened in 1860 when we have southerners who are portrayed as being subjected to the great evil slave power and the northerners they're nothing but Black Republicans, right? So you right. get the, and the dirty Republicans. immigrants and all of that kind yeah. of stuff, right? So, you know, I worry again today in terms of how people are informed and what shapes their perceptions of the world and how they're often so reduced and they're reduced because of this just dire need to always get clicks, always to get attention. And I think that the media is as failing us badly. Not because they're off to the left or off to the right. No.
No, because they have a different lord, overlord. It's or different god. Absolutely. It's it's money. It's, it's money. That's yeah, absolutely. The uh, the 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 thing I, I I don't watch the news. What I like to do is if I have the time, I'll watch like a congressional hearing on C-SPAN, because then you get <laughs> it all. You and ten other people. That's literally <laughs> the worst thing you can do. Why is that the worst thing you can do? Because here's why: if you watch the news, the news is going to take something that happened in one of those hearings. And they're going to spin it, right. and they're going to show you only a snippet of it, and then tell you what to think about the rest of it. Mm. If you watch the whole thing, you get to make a decision for yourself. And so I would rather do. Now I don't have the time to sit through all these things, I, I don't but not. but I can at least sit through like a fifteen minute or five minute uh, you know interlude between two people. Um, and and it, and it's interesting because then you get a different idea of what is. Possibly, you never really know what's going on, but what's possibly going on, as opposed to just getting it from the news. Yeah, absolutely, this admission by you though uh, confirms a, a fear that I had uh, from last night. And I thought, you know, you and I are in Frederick, and there's some great bars and great music scene actually there yeah. as well. And where are we? We are at a book launching party, right? <laughs> and, yeah. and now you tell me in your free time. I watch C SPAN. Yeah. No, and not C SPAN 3, but you're watching congressional committees. So yeah. maybe we should They're tonight. Fascinating. Let's, let's liven some things up for you, Matt. Yeah, okay. okay. Tonight, oh, we're going to bust into some book discussion someplace. Just bust into it. Preferably a bunch of streaking. You know, no, not streaking. Oh. No, we just bust in and liven it up with some of our provocative ideas. Oh, I like that. All we're right. We're not going to expose. Our body parts. All right. Well, I thought you wanted to really do it up, but <laughs> no, no, maybe not. We do need to liven up your social life, maybe a little bit. No, I don't think I need to liven it up. You don't. Right? No, I'm too old for a lively social life. <laughs> yeah. All right. Don't you feel the same way? No. Absolutely. You're older than I am. No, no, I don't at all. Well, you're better. You're in better shape than I am, I guess. I, I well, do, Colby, you're I, you're trying to talk. Go ahead, Colby. I, I, Dave. I thanks just... for the call. Do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, you notice how he told me to talk. I know. Oh, <laughs> I, I just yeah. want to say, I oh, honestly, go ahead. I, go ahead. You know what? Uh, the way you shit all over Colby, I'm getting offended by it. Last <laughs> week, you tried to not give him tickets, and, uh, and I'm. I I think before I get cut off for this, I'm. Voting to liberate Colby. <laughs> Dave, Dave, you're the man. I owe you a drink. Sometime, well, you'll but... be happy to know that Colby is getting the ticket. He, Lost he... cause must be damned. All that matters is liberating Colby. <laughs> wow. What did I miss? Wow. I've got love out in the audience right now. Colby, I, I, knew, I didn't know you were so impressed. Even, even though... Even though I will say, Colby, I'm just a stupid dog faced 11 Bravo infantryman. Hey, man. You know, infantryman, the, us infantrymen you know, got to hang Army. together. At least you're not a lion dog face yeah, pony soldier. Yeah, you know, you know when you probably didn't say that was when you were in the Marine Corps still. Now you're all high and mighty and veteran. <laughs> well, so you know like... what? I, I'll tell you where my because there is a big rivalry. My my opinion on that changed uh, when I actually went to like I, I my first deployment wasn't that crazy in Ramadi. I, I got there after most of the craziness was over. But when I did the push through Marja, my opinion on uh, the inner service stuff really changed. I infantry is infantry. So you guys, we got to stick together. You know, you, you, it's the uh, it's the crap job of the military man, but it's what drives it forward. And uh, so, infantry guys, you know, you got to you got to stick together. Army, yeah, we, we all do it. All, all, all that really matters is that we have like the most unhealthy camping Boy Scouts experience of all time. <laughs> you get comfortable yeah. sleeping in the rain. <laughs> uh, but no, man, I you know I thought your uh, I thought your questions were good. I I I have to agree with uh, Pete on this one. I, I'm even going to take it a step further. I think I think the the lost cause narrative. I think it's in its death throes. I from I grew up in the South. You know, I'm I'm from the South, and I can remember growing up. Um, and my you know, I asked my grandma when I was a kid about Sherman, and she looked at me and said, "That's an evil man. We don't talk about him." Fast forward to what it is like now. I mean, that's not the answer kids are getting nowadays in the South about Sherman. You know, he's he's the he's the first modern general. Uh, and, you know, in, in East America's history, possibly in the world's history, uh, he's a great tactician. He was a great leader and he he pursued total war to end the war quicker. Um, and, and that's the narrative that you I hear. Think he under, Sherman. Yeah, I think Sherman, even early in the war, just understood what it was going to be about. Yeah. And like that, if it's a war, of, I mean, I think one of the things to me. Uh, no, 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 no. 
Is there a dog there? Yeah, it's going on. I think it's his computer connection. Yeah, I think he's losing, I think he's losing connection. Yeah, no, I, just the last thing I'll say, I think that, um, and I say that a lot, but, uh, but no, the, the Civil War was the first war that wasn't fought sort of by warring, uh, how do I say it, uh, leadership in a country. It was a war about ideology, and it was a war about nationalism. And I think that that's what made it so bloody. And I think that also I'm lecturing a uh, doctorate of history <laughs> for college. So, uh, I'm going to no, shut up now. But thank you guys so much. Thanks, Dave. You have a, guys, you have a about, good night. I right. said something about Sherman real quick. Go ahead. Right. Sherman has a wonderful 1861 letter. You know, he was at Manassas, and mm -hmm. uh, his troops actually did okay. Uh, but one of the things he was appalled by early in the war, he was appalled that the volunteer soldiers, that they were undisciplined and that they did not respect private property. He was aghast. And he didn't think that they could ever be trained properly. The move toward hard war, I wouldn't call it total war because total war isn't really till I'd say World War II. But to hard war is a policy that evolved, I think, mostly from the ground. Uh, Sherman came to see that his men had no intention of protecting the private property of the very people who led the nation into civil war. And he also saw that for them to survive, that logistically it was very difficult to keep men in the field, uh, fed and equipped properly, that they were going to take matters into their own hands. And you see that from the very beginning. So there is a gradual move and evolution that happens not just on the ground, but happens and above. And Sherman is a genius mm. and if you ever get a chance read his letters they've all been uh, published um brooke simpson's the editor and his now ex-wife <laughs> his name i can't remember uh they edited the letters and i mean seriously they i used to read them at night before i'd go to bed i they're so powerful he's mm. so eloquent and so incredibly smart his letter to john bell hood when hood is about ready to give up to atlanta is masterful mm. i mean he just shames hood and basically says to hood stop whining that we're not fighting fairly he says you didn't think about this when you embarked upon secession did right you? and stop saying that god will judge us he said you know what god will judge us in good time we got a war to fight right. now, if you want to come back come back and we'll stop right now we'll move on and uh, it's a great book great isn't, that, isn't that interesting though like you know that is kind of it does seem to be the 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 thing where you know, the South was all piss and vinegar to start the war, to break away from the country. But then when they started losing, it was like, oh, like they cried foul ball. And it's like, wait, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> they certainly cried foul, foul ball about the, the practices of Union armies in the South. Yeah. Well, part of that, too, is you have to think about this. Uh, you know, as far as losses go, numbers can be fairly equivalent on both sides. But the, the, the devastation to... Uh, you know, livestock, crops, yeah. uh, the pop, like the, the civilian population, and those losses that the South are in, in you know, in, incurring, they can't replenish those. Right. So whereas the Union might you know, say both sides lose, well, we'll just use a, a smaller number, like 2,000 guys. The Union can recoup that fairly easily. Yeah. The South is going to feel that they're never going to get back to that point again. And by the end of the war, especially by the time Hood is over in Atlanta, um, I think I think the end. I mean, you, you read, uh, for instance, if you read Sam Watkins' book, that the, when he gets to the last little bit of the war, um, you can tell that there's just there's no there's no hope left. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, the hope is gone, and and they're clinging at that point. They're clinging to the only thing they have left, which is their faith, because everybody at that time is you know very right. strong uh, religion. You know, have a strong faith base. So um, I think that has part of it to, you know, it, it plays uh, uh, into part of it. Well, absolutely. I mean, you think of people on both sides, Northerners and Southerners, you said you know, Providence is going to determine the outcome of this war. And, hey, we're all God's chosen people. And, and again, that's one reason why the lost cause came into existence after Appomattox. Southern, white Southerners are like, uh-oh. <laughs> hey, I guess maybe we, we were God's chosen people in here after all. <laughs> but they still were able to explain to themselves why. And it's a, the lost cause, and this is, again, something for us. To, I'm just going to ask you all. Is there um, something lost 
when we lose the lost cause. If we simply just condemn it to the dustbin of history, say it's all trash, it's all myth, and it's the re- created all kinds of mischief over time, it, man, just like discredit the thing, put it aside and move forward. Is there a mistake, a risk in doing so? I think so, because it's the same as like if we were to remove the Confederate monuments here at Gettysburg. They're part of the story. They're artifacts. They're historic artifacts in and of themselves. And they have a story that goes with them from their dedication and all that other stuff. The time they were put up, who put them up, what was behind it, what was the purpose behind it. And it's the same thing with the lost cause. But I think what we need, though, is we need to um, get some solvent and some little Q-tips, like on a painting that's full of soot, and get down to the actual color, the real picture of the Civil War. And you do have to wipe away the lost cause. But I think the lost cause, there should be a new field of Civil War study just on the lost cause that basically juxtaposes the lost cause narrative and how it's and and just shows how it influenced the story of the Civil War over the years. Because I think that's the problem is like it's you're never going to get rid of it because there's some things that we probably don't really know what happened. But the lost cause took. Well, let me give you one thing. I give you one thing. I'm curious. It's a hypothesis. (laughs) (laughs) And there's Cam. (laughs) So there's hypothesis. What about R.E. Lee? Right. So R.E. Lee and the Lost Cause narrative, he's almost Christ-like, uh, right? Mm. Exactly. But he's okay. also venerated for his generalship. Okay, there's one part. We also, Lost Cause insists that he really didn't fight for slavery, that, uh, that the war was kind of thrust upon him, and he only did it to defend Virginia. So let's take those principles. Those are tenets, right? Are there any of those tenets you would say, hey, you know what, maybe we need to hold on to one of these? Any of them? Well, I, I, I actually... I feel like this ties back into how we started the conversation today uh, with, with the, the wedding, you know, the, the wedding of uh, memory and history. Right. And if you get rid of the lost cause, and I'll answer about the tenants there, but if you get rid of the lost cause, you're getting rid of the memory, uh, at least from one aspect of, of the war. Right, and what you can't do if you really want to understand the history, you have to have both because the memory right. encapsulates the feelings of the people at the right. time at the end of the war, um, and and you know they're they're dealing with this. I have to imagine overwhelming feeling of loss uh, at losing the war. You know, they lost they they've they've lost the way their society worked. They've lost many of them lost their homes, loved ones, and they lost the war. I mean, there's there's no. Uh, there's no upside to that. So this, you, you see a, a, an entire society in the South trying as hard as they can to find some kind of glory and, and, and something they can hold something up. Something to hold on to, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and to move forward with as, as part of the healing process. But to answer your question specifically, should, you know, should we hold on to at least one of those tenets? Well, the one that st- stands out to me uh, more so than any of those is Robert E. Lee's cause for fighting. Now, at the end of the day, like Robert E. Lee, they, they had something like 56 or 100 and something slaves at the Arlington Mansion. So, I mean, it, I don't know if slavery was a motivation there, but I do know in his, in his own writings, Robert E. Lee talks about he had to defend his home, Virginia, um, and, and which might not be the only reason why he fought, but that it, it was prominent to him. So in understanding Robert E. Lee, you have to put that in the forefront of, of how you interpret the man. So, Kobe, let me ask you this. In your military service and your conversations with many of your comrades, I know that when you're out on the front and fighting, at the end of the day, you're not sitting around the campfire and saying, hey, guys, let's talk about our motivation. No, no, right? no so you're not. Right. So listen, I, I get that, right? But the problem is, is too often then we want to strip soldiers throughout history of being political, right? I, I think that's a mistake. So let me ask you this, Colby. You guys were fighting for America and for the United States and an enemy that you believe that threatened us. Are you in agreement with that? Yeah, that's what gets you, that's what okay. gets you in. All right. So, Colby, let me ask you this. When you say you're fighting for your country and fighting for your home, if someone were to ask you to break that down into little parts, which, of course, you don't really have any need to do so because it's all embedded in your thoughts in almost an unthinking way. Some people would probably say, I'm fighting for my home, my YMCA, my church. Those are the small building blocks of why I fight for my country, why I defend my home. So when we talk about R.E. Lee, 
just defending Virginia, you can be absolutely certain he's thinking of the Arlington House, and he's thinking of those farms, he's thinking of those slaves, he's thinking of his church, he's thinking of his family. It is absolutely inseparable from all those little things. Most of us are never forced to be in a position in which we have to articulate that. Yeah, yeah. When you're a soldier like Colby, man, you sure as hell think about it from time to time, sure. even though you might not. As I tell my students, do you think Pickett's men got together before July 3rd and said, Let's do this one for slavery. Right. right? <laughs> but, were they, but they all they had to do is what? All they had to do was look behind the lines and what did they see? They saw enslaved men all over the place. Sure. They yeah. knew what the stakes of the game were. Yeah. Man, no mistake about that. Right? Yeah. Uh, you got another call here for you there, Petey. Uh, go ahead, call you're on the air. Is that me? Yes, that's you, sir. Hey, this is Lewis. Oh, hey Lewis. Hey. How you doing? Lewis Trot, ladies and gentlemen. How's everyone doing? Lewis. Yay. <laughs> Lewis, are you, are you calling to add this conversation or are you calling to talk about Saturday? Uh, well, <laughs> I don't know if I'm worthy to add to the conversation. I, I can add this. When I was in Iraq, I frequently asked why I was there. I didn't know what I was there. I was there because they told me to go. Mm. And I went there twice. And I came back and I was happy. So, uh, <laughs> that's 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 about the real you know, true the, thing the, you the can say. Modern, the modern military, for the most part, my experience was we don't look at the why. Right. We look at they're telling us to go somewhere. We're going to go there, whether it's downrange or Fort Bragg or to Iraq, Afghanistan, Djibouti, wherever. And we just go. And we as soon as we get there, we start thinking, when am I going home? Am I going home? I pray to God I'm going home. Yeah. But when am I going home? And that's that's how it is with with modern day. And I and there's a connection between modern day and the Civil War armies. Um, you know, they're regular people for the most part. It's the high echelon people who think about the why and the strategic. Uh -huh. The regular soldier out there in the field, they're barely talking, thinking about the tactical thing. They're just seeing what's in front of them and they're doing what they're told. Right. And, you know, and that's what I was, you know, I was just a, when the last time I went to Iraq, I was a staff sergeant. I moved up the food chain where I don't have to go out on guard duty, but I hadn't moved up much further than that. <laughs> so, well, so, uh, Lewis, uh, I, I, thought, I thought actually Lewis was calling to say, Carmichael, you better not talk this much on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> like, Carmichael, get this out of your system. <laughs> no, no, no. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I have invited Pete several times to come on these tours and I emphasize the fact that they are free and they're just just two hours right um, and this is the first time he's come and because I, I was able to connect it to something he's doing and I said we really need to uh, we really need to bring intelligence to these tours <laughs> and so I really need Pete to, Pete to come out there and uh, you know push this up to a highbrow status where you know <laughs> we're, we're pretty much low brow yeah. in the previous <laughs> tours I'm so, not capable uh, I am of very high honored. Yeah. Well, I am very honored that uh, you're, you're coming out there and uh, you finally accept the invitation. I think it'll be fun. Yeah, um, it will be fun. Well, you know and, what? Hold on, Lewis. Uh, hold on there. Yeah. Let, let, I got I to gotta do a break. So when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about yeah, yeah, the tour. So I'm going to put you back on hold and we'll, uh, we'll come back and uh, talk about uh, all that stuff. Right after these words, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll be right back. Dial? We are too. We'll be right back. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum, is housed in the historic Lutheran Seminary building constructed in 1832, a witness to the first day of battle. The museum's three floors of exhibits connect visitors to the dilemmas that led to the Civil War, provide a powerful and personal view of the battle's first day, and explore one of the battlefield's largest hospitals. No visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center is complete without a guided tour of the building's famous cupola, where on the eve of battle, officers and civilians saw thousands of Confederate soldiers' campfires 
burning to the west, and Brigadier General John Buford watched for vital federal reinforcements as fighting erupted on the morning of July 1st. Today, you can stand where Buford stood and discover how this view helped chart the course of the Battle of Gettysburg. Your trip to Gettysburg is not complete without a serious visit to Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center, Gettysburg's premier museum. Purchase tickets online at seminaryridgemuseum.org or call 717-339-1300. To get tickets or a cupola tour, listeners may call or walk in and mention address in Gettysburg or by ordering online using the promo code AG1863 for 20% off. Seminary Ridge Museum and Education Center. It began here. There's a devil to pay. If you're a lover of history, then go to trhistorical.com. There you'll find apparel, drinkware, decor, and more featuring a wide range of interests from the ancient world to the Cold War. Looking to make an impression with the perfect gift? Well, TR Historical now offers gift cards and a vintage wrapping service for a truly unique presentation. And our listeners will receive 10% off plus free shipping in the U.S. when you use promo code GBERG1863. So go to trhistorical.com, trhistorical, for the love of history. Think outside the bus and let family-owned Gettys Bike Tours take you on a cycling journey across the picturesque and historic Gettysburg battlefield. There's no better way than by bicycle to gain a feel for the terrain of the battlefield. Slow enough to see it all, yet fast enough to do it all. Follow the route of Union troops entering the fray as you ride to the site of the first shots of this epic three-day battle. Feel the drama as you put yourself in the position of a Confederate soldier just before he steps off to make Pickett's charge. Take a stand with the heroic Colonel Chase Chamberlain on the slopes of Little Round Top, just before you view the fields of honor beneath you from its summit. All of our guides are officially licensed by the National Park Service. So don't get a sore neck trying to see out of your car and saddle up with Getty's Bike Tours for a 360-degree view of America's most important piece of real estate. Getty's Bike Tours. Think outside the bus. Go to Getty'sBike.com or call 717-752-7752 to book a battlefield experience you will never forget. You've heard us promote various ways that you can help us keep the show going, but one way we haven't pushed too much is our subtlery at AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. That's a shame because we have designs over there by talented artists like Ty DeWitt of 1863 Designs and Mike Stretch of the Heritage Depot. So now we're promoting it. Buying shirts, hoodies, mugs, and other items from our sutlery not only helps us keep the lights on, but it also helps guys like Ty and Mike, and it helps spread the word about the show every time you wear an item or you sip from your mug. So head over to AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop and grab some merch. It's the perfect Christmas gift for the Gettys nerd in your family. That's AddressingGettysburg.com slash shop. Have you noticed our revamped website at AddressingGettysburg.com? Well, that's the fine work of a man named Mike Stretch, and he also redid our logo for us. Both of them I originally designed, and both of them were originally horrible, but now they're nice, and that's all thanks to Mike. Mike has an awesome t-shirt company called Heritage Depot. There you'll find great designs based on Gettysburg and the Civil War with t-shirts and other types of merchandise. So go to Heritage-Depot.com and spruce up your Getty's Nerd wardrobe. That's heritage-depot.com. Our favorite bookstore in Gettysburg is For the Historian, located at 42 York Street. It's because they have the best selection of Civil War books in Gettysburg, both new and used. And online, they have even more to choose from. And if the Civil War isn't your thing, that's not a problem. This is for the historian, after all. They cover history from the ancient world to the 21st century with a strong selection of World War II and American Revolution books. It's astounding how many thousands of titles from Osprey, Savas Beattie, UNC Press, and more they have in their store. And that's because, well, they have a warehouse too. And that's where they keep all the books that are available online at forthehistorian.com. And folks, if you go to forthehistorian.com now and order books until you're blue in the face, be sure you mention that you heard about them on addressing Gettysburg in the note to seller box and they will refund your shipping costs. And if you prefer to stop by when you're in town, well, you could do that too. Just mention addressing Gettysburg at checkout and they'll take 20% off the retail price of your item. So go to forthehistorian.com or stop by 42 York Street or you can call them at 717-685-5207. That's forthehistorian.com or 717-685-5207.
You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. You're back with Cam's Idol. Uh Uh-uh, that was years ago. Here's Matt. Well, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, September 16th, 2023, that's this coming Saturday, is uh, our second to last get out of the car tour of the 2023 season. Where has the time gone? Where has the time gone? I mean, really, it's been this year just flew by. As as Debbie said earlier when we were talking about it, she goes like a fart in the wind. That's what that she's... is absolutely how I phrased it. Exactly. Thank you. And uh, vanished like a fart in the wind. What, that? what is that from? Young I don't know. Man. I just made it up. Oh, maybe I didn't. I don't know. It could be from something. But anyway, it, it, Lewis, you're back on the phone now, right? Yes. All right. Great. Uh, so we're doing Robinson's Division at Oak Ridge, and here's uh, here's the booklet that you're going to get, ladies and gentlemen. This is a different type of tour that we're doing. Um, I mean, it's still basically the same. Lewis is the uh, the guide. He put the tour together. But he asked his buddy Peter Carmichael to uh, come along and, and, and add some stuff. What are you going to do, Pete? Are you going to add like the so, human interest stuff? Or? I'd say, yeah. So Lewis is doing play by play, and I'll do a little color commentary from every once in a while. Very That's nice. That, right? So I've got a few like stories of soldiers there that I like to talk about. And Lewis and I have spent, actually, we were out there a month or so ago, uh, and we're interested in, in the Neal's Brigade. Yeah, so it was in July. So we've worked together before. We were kind of, I don't know how, even how it happened, sort of just randomly assigned to do Kemper's Brigade, 18th Virginia in particular. And, yeah, it was just, you know, it was great. A wonderful connection. At the CWI. At the CWI yeah. a few years ago. It rained like hell, but we did, we walked the charge, and then we drove uh, to the field hospital for Pickett's Division. It was a great day, and he's become a really good friend and colleague. And, you know, it's just the kind of thing that I like to see around here is being able to work with people who come at this from different angles. Yeah, so, exactly. But seriously, man, Lewis is going to take the lead on this. I, I mean, I've thought about it, but I've not thought about it with the kind of seriousness in terms of the tactical level that he has. I'm very interested in Robert Rhodes. I know we're focusing on Robinson's division, but a lot of the things that Lewis has said to me about O'Neill's attack, which we'll get into those details later, but I think there's calls for a reevaluation of Rhodes, who certainly didn't have his best days at Gettysburg, but on July 1st, I think he brought a degree of coordination to that opening attack there that maybe we haven't fully appreciated that. Yeah. And Lewis and I might disagree about that, which is a great thing as well, that we can go back and forth. But this booklet, uh, Lewis and I put together, it's got some maps in it. We have some primary source accounts from some of the survivors, Union and Confederate. He's tantalizing. Call, the call me. Where, no, oh, wait. Oh, sorry, I was <laughs> wait for you to go to. There, I, was, there, I was letting the man finish. So we got got a you can go there. to one three if you Why want. Why don't you go ahead and turn the page there? Man. All right, I'll turn the page. Let's see what's on the next page. Oh, more maps. There we go. And a Some picture of a guy. That's Rush Caddy. We'll talk a lot about him. 97th New York. His fascinating story. His letters are up at Hamilton College and. I've got to know him fairly well over the last few months. I'm writing a book that he's a part of. And then you got a lot of, it uh, looks like, letters or we reports. We have some letters from and... Iverson's Brigade as well. And, uh, and that's, again, for everybody to keep. I think it's always wonderful. That's a, uh, an incredible account. Lewis, I don't know if you've seen this. It's a member of Hanover Artillery who came upon what we call now Iverson's Pits. And he writes a really graphic uh, account uh, in his diary. It's uh, Berkeley's his name. What's his first name? It's not Henry, is it? Matt, you're looking right at. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to sure find the name. It's, it's, uh, it's Hanover Artillery. I know that. Berkeley's is like William Robbins' diary. William Rob- Robbins. Okay. Yeah, well, Southern Historical Collection. Henry Berkeley, and it's William. No, no, it's not William Robbins. William Robbins. No, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, Robbins is fascinating. <laughs> Robbins was on the um, what you would call it, the Battlefield Commission, but he would take people around the field. A lot of veterans. He was a veteran himself. I think he was from. He's a Carolinian. I think he might have been Iverson's brigade. But he would then write in his diary, and his diary is at the University of North Carolina, mm-hmm. and and he has this fascinating sort of summary of a conversation with survivors of Iverson's Brigade about what happened. His diary is just as uh, Lewis. Have you ever seen his diary, Robinson's diary? 
I have not. Yeah, it's worth checking out. I think the park might have copies. Well, and in, as you look through this, ladies and gentlemen, you see pages of, you know, like full excerpts from books or diaries or letters oh, or God. whatever. Don't worry. Pete's not going to read them all, and, right? And, You're going to read parts of them. Hey, listen, I found something, and I don't know, Lewis, if you feel this way. That a killer on a tour is to read yes. long quotes. Yes. People just can't follow it. So you got to give them an excerpt. you got to give them to summarize. But what's nice is for the people who will come, they'll be... I'll have this, right? And right. And then sit back Abra at home and read the entire elegantly. thing. <laughs> yeah. Like, there's something about, like, reading that it's just, it, you lose an all. Unless you're a good reader. You just got to read an excerpt. I just a bit. An excerpt. Right. Go ahead. Let me interrupt. Go ahead. This is, was this our fourth year doing these things? It is. I've, I've been reading profusely throughout these things, and I haven't lost people. So... <laughs> but this is the only time I do read. That's and true. I'm not you very do good at reading out loud. Yeah, that's right. You do. You do read, but uh, but you but you don't read. I, you read profusely, but you're doing excerpts. You're doing little bits and pieces here and there. You're not doing like you know three pages. Yeah, and I only read what a soldier wrote. Right. And that's my that's my own self imposed parameter. I don't bring out some other historians' thoughts and you know read what they think. It's it's words directly from soldiers in the spot that they're talking about. That's right. how I try to connect right. the words with the place. And, and a lot of times they're talking about terrain or it, I remember when we did last year, we did O'Neill and Iverson and we stood down there where the pits are right. and read the words of the soldiers that were standing down there in that spot that we stood in. And that's how I try to connect it. And that's why I think it, it really brings home meaning to what the soldiers thought and felt at the time and they wrote about afterwards. So that's, I do a lot of reading on these tours. It's the only time I really read, um, but I think there's a purpose to it. And right. I think that changes it a little bit better. Yeah, I, I, agree. I just hope that the word epitome is not as well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to stumble on that again. <laughs> there is a kid. You know, in... I, I, I'm not the best reader and I fumble all over words. If they got more than two syllables, I'm in trouble. Yeah, but you know, I don't. You haven't had epitome yet. He's also got that command press. No, no, I haven't had that one. No. There was no. a kid in high school. We, we had to read out. It was a sophomore year of high school English class, and we had to read something out loud. And he 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 read the line, and it was something like, um, "You'll have one halluva time doing that." And everybody started <laughs> laughing. <laughs> and he looked up. He's like, "What?" And we're like, "It's halluva, not halluva." But you know who's who's seen Helleva right. written out Absolutely. in tenth right, grade, right? right? By the, nobody's seen that. It's but not the, his the, fault. This is a, a mispronunciation, but this is uh, good, I think, evidence for this from people who witnessed it uh, many years ago. A seasonal historian at uh, the Angle Pickett's Charge, referring to Lewis Armistead, and said, hmm. <laughs> and he. Stood as erect as I am now. <laughs> <laughs> his friends raced away from the group, right? Yeah. Avril <laughs> his men elegantly. <laughs> That's funny. I, I'm serious though, about Lewis. I, I wonder if that uh, pickup line worked. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be Lewis's stage. I'm happy to jump in there. I have some questions for Lewis. We have a really, like I said, a good time out there. I'm really looking forward to meeting everybody. Well, and be I've been fun. telling everybody to show up wearing a scarf in your honor. So I hope you wear one because it's gonna be too hot. No, just to just to show right, up, I'll and then everybody could put them back in their cars okay. before we All leave. Right, we'll do that. And I mean, don't we have an after party. That's what I was. Yeah, promised. then we go. Then we go to Farnsworth for uh, lunch afterwards. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And I hope you'll join us for that. Absolutely. Yeah, you're always too busy to stick around for dinner yeah, or lunch. No, no, because you give me the invite at the very last moment, just <laughs> like for tonight. By I'm the way, by the way. Uh, Lewis, you as well, uh, but everybody that's in with the near shot, the Christmas party this year yes. is December 9th at Saverhood. Oh, I love Saverhood. So, so we've got plenty uh, of room. I'll Last year we didn't have enough room. People love wanted to come, you know, and we have this year. I'll, I'll put the registration link up later. I haven't done it yet, but uh, so just so you know, you have the invite, not the day before, right. months ahead of time, December 9th. Mark it on your calendar. Best tacos in Gettysburg at Saverhood. I haven't had the tacos, I but I like the rice like, balls. I just like it known. Oh, so good. What, I, I'd like it known that I haven't missed any of the events. 
I've been at every event. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Big fan. What would we do? Supporter. What would I never? We never thought of that. What would we do if you couldn't make it to one? Not have it. Oh, I'll get it. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You need to cancel it. Yeah, we would, wouldn't we? <laughs> all right. Well, it's not <laughs> like I'd have to refund anything. It's free, you know. I right. always pay. You were what? I'm a paying contributor to this game. Yeah, you are. No, you're you're in it to win it. You are in it to win it. That's so, it. Uh, uh, can I have this uh, fact about Robinson's division? I can tell you need to move on here. Now this Did is you... just a hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if even Lewis knows this. Robinson's division had the highest percentage loss of all the divisions in the Army of the Potomac. All the divisions. Did you know that, Mike Lentz? Six questions is nodding his head. He knew nodding that. Yeah. He knows Wadsworth, all. Wait, Wadsworth yeah, was, yeah. was next. Second. I was going to say, that had to be close. Yeah, Wadsworth those first corps guys, you know, they don't get the credit for, or, they or in the 11th Corps, well, they, they don't, don't get, get the credit, credit for getting the shit kicked out of them. They don't spend mm-hmm. time on, on the first day. Yeah. You know, I'd like to spend some time with Lewis and 11th Corps stuff, which I don't know so well, and I'd like to spend some time. Yeah, with that'd you, be nice. You, uh, with, with Robinson's division, you got to take into account, too, the 16th Maine is, to, is told to stay to the last man. Mm-hmm. They lose close to 78%, but mm-hmm. the vast majority of those men are captured, captured yeah. rather than killed or wounded. Right. But there's still a loss. They're, they are right. orders to combat, as they say. Right. Right. Yeah, that's the, right, right, because they're useless. They can't be used again, so they're yeah, lost. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, that, that plays a big part into it. Mike Lentz would like to join in. Go ahead, Mikey. And no regiment in Paul's brigade suffers less than 90 captured. No regiment in Paul's brigade suffers less than 90 captured. Yes. Wow, that is quite a statistic. It really is. <laughs> That's pretty interesting. <laughs> did you come up with that on your own or did somebody else? Oh, did you? I have that right here. 66.8% casualty rate is higher than Iverson's brigade, which was at 65%. Paul's brigade, which is right 16th Main's part of, suffered tremendously. Uh. So Mike Lentz will be the third guy yeah, giving the, the other uh, thing you information do. on the tour. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. The other thing you got to do with numbers, you've got to look at the raw number, because if your if your number's smaller, it's easier to get to a higher percentage. That's so the the um, yeah. what do you call it? Just the, the raw number right. might be greater for other regiments right. or brigades. I'm sure Iverson's brigade lost more of a raw number rather than the percentage. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, that I'm sense. not a mathematician, right. but I figured that, that over. Yeah. yeah, I've been past sixth grade math, so, <laughs> so uh, your guess so, is as good so as mine. Lewis, how would you describe the First Corps' retreat into Gettysburg? A run, a jog, <laughs> a walk? I'm serious. Like, I, how would you describe it? Them I, I, I think so. it starts off as a, as a fast movement, I, and they don't go, you know, straight down the Mummersburg Road. Right. They retreat to the railroad track. And it's not the middle railroad cut, it's the one on Semin- uh, Seminary Ridge that everybody forgets about. There's three cuts in the railroad. The middle one's the most famous. The other two are, are partially in the woods. Mm-hmm. So right. they retreat back to that, that cut. That's where the 16th Maine has the majority of their men captured. Huh. That's when they decide to tear up the two flags. Yeah. Um, and then they all, they're going down the Chambersburg Pike. How much running they're doing, I don't know, because it's got to be congested. Right, you got right, artillery in the road right, trying to get right. through the town. So you're on the sides. The ground's uneven. That's going to slow you down. Right. Um, but once they're in town, I think it's just pell-mell trying to get to the hill. So will we get to see where the 16th Maine, where they were captured on Saturday? No. Oh. No. I, well, I can take now. you there, I'm but not we're not going to take the group. Cause it, <laughs> Pete quits. <laughs> if I don't get my way, I quit. You know what, <laughs> you know what Pete? I, I've been there, and where that cut is, um, there's like a, a, a train maintenance shop back there. Yeah. It's where the, that line branches off to the north. Yep. And the time to go there is in the wintertime, and I'd that's like when I get, that. I've been there in the winter. Because, yeah. there's, contra- because there's a right. – I'm just saying there's some controversy there's a marker there back that, there. Right? Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah. It's close to the college campus, correct? Uh, it has to be. What? Yeah. yeah, that's right there. Yeah, it's it's all. Well, there that. was and there was this controversy before I arrived. Right, you had nothing to do with I this. I had nothing to do with it, but again, we discovered it's one of our first Gettysburg incidents. I say we. It's with my family and my wife Beth, and we were at a party, and this uh, guy came up to Beth, and she, he gave it. He was pissed and he was angry. He was angry about the railroad cut, right? And. Uh, 
my wife said to him, but when did this even happen? He told I forgot the year. And my wife said, I was nine years old when this happened, right? Mm. But he knew that she was married to me, and somehow the Civil War Institute in Gettysburg College was still culpable for this trading of land, I guess. But right. It was extremely controversial. Right? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. 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 Right. And it appears that the college maybe made the wrong decision there. If you are a believer in historical well, of course, which, they should which be. clearly the one college is not. One of the worst not. things that happened is Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, which has one of the best historic preservation programs in the country. They allowed development on their campus that leveled two impressive earthworks that Confederate artillery had held oh. at Second Fredericksburg. And it's just outrageous, and you get a. a <laughs> College is noted for historic preservation, and they said, "Yeah." I don't understand that. Doesn't happen a lot. I don't get that. I I do not get that at all. Um, All right. Well, so Lewis, we're going to meet. Where are we meeting at the at the uh, the 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 peace light? Right. No, we're going to (laughs) meet on the other side, the south of the Mumsburg Road. So we're meeting at the, the 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 observation tower near the tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't want to meet the, across the road because we don't. Because then we got to cross. We don't it. have to do that. Um, but yeah. uh, there is parking and, and up it, near it, the peace light, and we must remind everybody: do not park in the bus parking spaces. Just park in car parking yeah. spaces. If you park along park roads, make sure that your all four wheels are on the pavement, unless there's a you know a, a pull off that's very clearly you know sanctioned by the park service. Um, and then we will meet and start the tour there at uh, the um, tower. What time? Well, yeah, there's, there's the, a little bit more walking compared to last month, but oh, um, nice. Okay, good. There's not a there's not a ton of walking. Um, I know there was a gentleman in a wheelchair. Um, yep. Last month, mm-hmm. he'd be good for part of the tour because we're going to go down and see the 13th Massachusetts, 104th Pennsylvania monuments, which are kind of down the slope. Um, you might get down. I don't know how you're going to get back up unless somebody's pushing you. So, well, it's not. Um, it was a, there is it was a road a, that winds down there. Yeah, it was a. It was a. It had a motor. Um. um so oh, yeah. Right. Okay. So, and then, so um, go ahead. And, and so it's it's not a ton of walking. We're saving that for October. And I will say, this is a, a different tour than the previous tours I've given, where it's it's matter of fact. This happened here. This is what the soldier said. In this tour, I'm questioning what the, um, it's not 100%, but what the vast majority of the story people accept today of what happened. The O'Neill attack, the Iverson attack, and how a Baxter and Paul's brigade defend that ridge. Talking with Pete when we went out there and reading a, um, some, a wide variety of things, I've come to the conclusion that things aren't as plain as we thought they were based on what the soldiers wrote. So, and I'm not going to say anything more because I want people to come out and hear what I have to say further. Exactly. And of course, that's called a a tease in the entertainment world. (laughs) (laughs) And then, uh, um, what was it? Oh, so uh, Pete asked what time the tour starts at 10, but it's of course, uh, smarter to get there beforehand. Nine 30. That should be be pretty good. Uh, yeah, Lewis will be out there at nine. We'll all be getting there shortly after nine o'clock with the, uh, the flag, um, and uh, let's see. That's about it, I think, for there. And then, of course, everybody's going to get this nice little booklet that Pete had printed up. Uh, thank, uh, thank you very much for that, okay. Peter. There, and uh, there is there is information. I want you to pay attention to this, folks. When you get the thing, go on the inside, and there's information about the 2024 summer conference. And I have to tell you, <laughs> uh, Lewis, you've been to it too, right? You you were a, you were a guide. Well, I've given a tour. Yes, yeah. and um, well. Weren't you in attendance? What was it this year or last year? I thought I thought I. This year I gave a tour. They asked me to. The year before is when through you were just the bureaucracy. They said they had to have a guide with every tour, and the other person supposed to be with Pete. Right. Fell ill, so it, know, it ended up being just me and Pete. Right. Okay. So, um, but it, it is a, it is a really fun time. You, you, you ladies and gentlemen, yeah. you've heard me talk about this many times. That it is a, a great time. You got to go. There's different. You don't have to go the whole time, right, Pete? You can go for one day or two days, or right. We have weekend only uh, uh, as well. And I'm really excited on Monday night. Uh, David Malgi is going to come and show some of his remarkable yeah. Gettysburg artifact collection. And 
uh, we're going to have a cash bar, and it's going to be very informal. So oh, we're good. Gonna sit around on Monday night and drink beer. And look at oh, no, some I'm more looking forward to that. Right. That'll be good. No, no, it's I'm going to be come this that. Monday or Monday in June. Monday in June during we're the conference. During the conference. Dave Malgi's a great guy. He, great I'm sure guy. you've seen his collection yeah, at his house, absolutely. right? Yeah, it's remarkable. It's the coolest stuff. Yeah. Um, he's a really nice I guy. I took Scott Hartwig out there. I said, Scott. I said, this Malgi guy supposedly has some good stuff. I said, let's go. He says, all right. And, of course, Scott was blown away. And Scott said, I just thought maybe he had a few bullets or something. I'm like, no, it's, no, it's really remarkable. It's its own museum. But what's great about Maugi is that it's not, I mean, people collect for various reasons. And for him, it's about the history. It's about the stories. He connects the people to it. He humanizes these things. He came to my Gettysburg class. I do a class just on Gettysburg. He was fantastic. So he's going to be at the conference. And we're also doing something else different. It's a... We do half of Tuesday in the class prepares you to go off into the battlefield. And people loved it. It was like three hours classroom discussion, readings. And so it's it's kind of like we know what we'll be doing here on Saturday. Yep. This document booklet, trust me, I won't be quizzing in anyone. I won't be reading. <laughs> no, it's it. just for you to <laughs> have. Just, no, I'm not going to do that. But it's nice to have this resource to be able to read and to think and to reflect and, yeah. and, uh, and then have these great conversations. Hell, I'm looking forward to the Farnsworth House. It's always fun mm -hmm. to get to meet new people. And uh, Well, and I think people will really like getting to sit and talk with you in a social setting as well. Right. right yeah. Um, all right. So, Lewis, thank you. We'll see you on Saturday. Have, uh, have yourself a good Friday. Thank you, and uh, looking forward to it. Hope to see a lot of people out there. I appreciate yeah. it, Pete. Yeah. Well, All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, Lewis. Um, we thank have uh, another caller here who wants to thank you. So, Brian, once the thing boots up here, you are on the air, Brian. Go ahead. Hi, Matt. Uh, hi, Peter. How you doing? Good. Thank you. All right. Listen, I wanted to call and thank you because uh, – I was I was when I was put on the board of directors at the GAR Museum in Philadelphia. They asked me to do a presentation on the Common Soldier, and I reverted back to Gary Gallagher's uh, Great Courses chapter to kind of give me a framework on what to discuss. And then I said, you know, what else is out there? So I started burning up the internet and I started watching all your interviews when you were doing the book tour, the Common Soldier, and the the, the point of view you brought to it and the emotion and the evolution of the the soldiers, it was just, I, I became an instant fan. Um, I, it may have been how I even found a dress in Gettysburg. Um, and I, I just wanted to just call because you, you, I, I love your work. I love the passion you bring. And you're, you're a special guy, man. I just want to thank you for everything you do. There you go. Very nice. It's very, very nice. I, I, I can't, I'm kind of speechless. I, I really appreciate that. And I, been doing this for a long time as i said i've i felt a deep connection to this place i feel a deep connection to those letters and i think for all of us that are a part of it right it's this holy grail that we're searching for but we'll never ever find it but uh, a journey you know along the way right we just keep discovering new things and thinking about it differently and i sometimes get annoyed when people are like saying we need to honor these soldiers and i i, I sort of get what they mean by it i think the way to honor them is to study them relentlessly, and, mm -hmm. and, and and that's what we do. And then to go to that ground and try to get an appreciation for what they endured, but we never can. And I know a lot of people know this. I've said it before. My my father, the man who adopted me, uh, he was drafted, 18. The guy, he graduated fifth in his class in high school out of seven guys. <laughs> <laughs> he came from southern Indiana, man. He was dirt poor. And, the war, that, that war, whatever he went through, did something to him. He wouldn't talk about it much. But I heard him many a night screaming out. Mm. And we assumed that, of course, it had to be about what he endured. And so Colby's a good friend, man. And I admire and respect everything that he's gone through. And that, I'll say, is this. I thought about it a lot today. Sometimes you feel like a fraud when you're studying this and you've never actually been under fire. Yeah. You know? I was a reenactor. <laughs> That hardly counts, right? <laughs> and so I appreciate what you said. It means a great deal to me. And I'm looking forward. I hope you'll be at this event on Saturday. And looking forward to meet other people as well. Because like I said, you know, we're all in this together. And we can learn so much from each other. And Lewis is a good example. Man, I've really enjoyed getting to know him. It's been a good deal. He's a great guy. He absolutely mm -hmm. He's super smart. He knows this stuff. He thinks about it really critically. And he here's the best part of it. 
he never thinks he owns a part of the battlefield. I, that's the part that kind of mystifies me when somebody's like, I'm the expert. Oh, I'm yeah. Like, man, come on, man, lighten the hell up. Right. Right. He's not like that at all. And he's open. He's engaging. He's a good dude. I understand why he's so popular. Yeah. And um, uh, I, you know, you're. You say you feel uh, what was no, you didn't say hypocritical. What was the word you used? Uh, oh, fraud. Like a fraud. Fraud. Yeah. Fraud. Like a fraud. Thank fraud. Thank you. Yeah. You feel like a fraud. Yeah. But the thing is, I don't think in order to tell a story, you need to have experienced it. You just need to be able to research it well, and maybe put a little bit of, you know, imagination might not be the word, but you have to empathy. You have to empathize, even if you haven't been through it. Um, with the guys and I think you do a great job of that you really think about what it was like for these guys and you try to convey that to Average schmucks like me Matt you've said the word that Schmuck is, not the word, schmuck. You're not a schmuck Matt. You're a historian which you oh, and I Jesus. go around and around circles. Yeah, we're not doing that again Empathy is the most important the most important quality you can have as a historian You you cannot do our job without empathy and, and that's not sympathy there's difference. Mm. Right? right. So when I tell my students, you want to try to understand the experience of the Confederate soldier, you, know, you need to empathize with them, understand the physical world they inhabited, the constraints of that world. Uh, and when they start to do that, I'm like, okay, you know what? Because obviously I'm at a college. The, the People are leaning to the left, and they're hypercritical of certain elements, particularly those people who are far right wing who support Trump and who are working class. And I'm like... Don't you dare write people off and condemn them without first trying to understand why they entertain those views. Yep. Just as you can't say that, hey, man, the guys who followed R.E. Lee here into Pennsylvania, they were duped. They got slaughtered for a slaveholding class that didn't give a damn about them. That's just not true. So, you know, empathy. Again, that's not sympathy. That doesn't mean we're not so critical. But empathy, empathy, empathy. And I think, you know, well. Make the world a hell of a lot better place. It but would. it sure as hell makes us better historians. Yeah. There's just no doubt about it. Absolutely. That. And I can tell you, at least from my perspective, right, you know, having been in it, having, having gone to war and, and for the country and all that, you know, people like you, Pete, people like you, Matt, um, any, anybody anybody out there that, that dedicates their life to upholding the legacy and, 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 and progressing the legacy of the American, the, you know, the, the American warrior, that, yeah. that's... That's the foundation of what I try to do on my show, and and you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a combat vet to be able to do that. What you have to have, like you said, one is empathy, and two is a passion for it. Yeah, and and a way, and and really, all you're trying to do is ignite that passion in others, even if it's a little, a little flame that you ignite. Yeah, um, because yeah. you never know who you might inspire. You know, I I was inspired at a very young age by historians to join the military because of the stories I was being, you know told mm -hmm. um you even though you didn't everybody has a part to play so even you even though you didn't serve your telling of these stories you're you're um you're pushing and in, in, in upholding this legacy is inspiring future generations to do what the guys did that you're studying yeah. you know it's so, so it's 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 a it's a full circle you know that everything yeah. is connected yeah. and um uh, and, and you're phenomenal at it yeah. Uh, well, that's, so. that's really nice of you to say. I'll tell you why I didn't go into the military. I was in Boy State, which is, you know, the saying in like your up, uh, upcoming senior in high school, and you're supposed to, the American Legion puts it on, these veterans, and they put you in these flats, and you, you drill, and it's got a sort of military orientation to it, but it's also to learn about civics. So this is what happened in my one week. I got so many demerits. Because I couldn't make my bed properly. I couldn't. You know, the dumb damn coins would bounce off of them. So at first, my mom was giving me hell. She wanted me to go to VMI. I said, Mom, I can't even make my bed. Mm. I'll be a rat here. They'll get me out of here in a week, right? I'll never, ever make it. So not making so my bed. So that's how you got out is not making your bed. I, I knew I wouldn't hack it. I couldn't. And I probably would melt. I melted. We got, we'll go back to Pistol Pete, man. I My basketball coach, he took me in the middle of the court once before practice, and he just lit into me. And I swear to God, it took everything in my power not to break down and cry. And after that, I thought, can you imagine me in boot camp? Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Please don't yell at me. Right, 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 right. Here's the, here's the truth about it, though. 
A lot of kids cry at boot camp. You just don't oh, hear oh, about I'm sure. It. Yeah. You should hear the listen when it, when the lights go out at uh, nighttime. You hear the sniffling, <laughs> dude. It is like every other rack. There's <laughs> kids in there crying. When you get letters on Sunday, when they hand yeah. out your letters, kids are reading the letters and crying on the my pages. Mommy. <laughs> yeah, of it's, course. It's uh, it's it's that's like the first month. After the first month, you know, everybody kind you you, you get used to your environment, right? Like well, you, yeah. you become acclimatized. But yeah. It's, it's like that for everybody. As you know, no, I don't care how, in air quotes, tough you are. You know, if you're joining when you're, it's different if you join when you're older. But if you're joining at 18 or 19, and I don't care who you are, man, it's it's a rude awakening for everybody. Yeah. But that, you know, I, I have this conversation all the time with people, um, I, whether they're historians or whether they're, uh, typically I'll have this with, like, you know, older guys, like people like my, my stepfather's age or older. And uh, they're like, man, I wish I would have joined. Or I wish, you know, I you can't look at it like that because the the reality of war is you could have joined and died and then everything that you've created up to this point your family and all that stuff never would have happened you know Mm -hmm. um you you play you both you and matt both play a very important role in in the military believe it or not because of the fact that your your storytelling and your your you know, passing on this this story from our our past and and past military experiences inspires future. Well, we love you guys. I mean, I, I don't know. I can't speak for Pete, but I I have always grown up admiring people in the military because I knew even as as a little kid, I was like, I yeah, I'd never be able to do that. <laughs> and I admire people who do what I can't do. Right. So you know, it, I think it, the other thing, uh, Colby, I'm curious about this. This is a horrible comparison, but I'm going to make it. So. Colby and I both do CrossFit, and we have a great coach. He's Clay is like the best coach I've ever had. But we get under duress, and like my he Clay's very patient with me. But I start forgetting all kinds of things that we're supposed to be doing. Whether it's form, I start to lose count. Like where, how many are we supposed to do again? <laughs> Clay's like seriously, like every stereotype of an academic. I have confirmed it. <laughs> yeah. It's like a flaky, oh, aloof. Like, yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah. I, I walk someplace. He's like, Pete, why did you go through here? It's quicker for you to go there. I said, I'm an academic, and we always make things harder. Like, that's what we do. But here's my point to Colby. Man, I can't imagine being under that physical duress, being utterly exhausted, and now suddenly i got to start thinking about a range and where my target is and – I mean, it's. Uh, You'd be I... surprised, but that the, what what that is. Uh, there's a few things that go into that. Be- that's why you do. That's why you rehearse things so much in that's the military, true. right? Like I can tell you, I spent when I when I made it to the fleet, which is when you get to your unit and right. after you finished all your training, you know, boot camp and school of infantry, that you call it get into the fleet when you find a, finish right. all that and right. you get to your unit. Uh, it's a haze. I'm just going to tell you the truth. It's a haze fest, or at least it was when I joined, right? I mean, I I, I didn't sleep the first week. I was uh, all up all night in uh, skivvy shorts, skivvy shirt, wearing a gas mask in the community shower. They had all the shower heads on as hot as they could go and dumping bleach on the ground so the Ooh. steam would carry it up and you're Ooh. scrubbing. Ooh. It's it, They're doing all that stuff, right? So you're always under duress, and that doesn't last too long, But you, but there are things like that that continue. And I would spend hours with the other guys that, you know, the other boots that came in, that got dropped with me. We'd spend hours doing mag chain drills, right? You would just stand, hold that you would be holding your rifle with one arm like on the pistol grip, the, the butt stock of the rifle in your shoulder, and you would just keep speed reloading magazines over and over and over and over and over again. And you do that for hours. But then you get to a point in combat where you are under under extreme duress. You don't have to think about that. Right. It's the same thing right. with every aspect you're right. talking. It's also, training. In combat, your focus... It's it's almost like it's almost it's it's weird to say, but it is almost superhuman. You have the ability to focus in on things like never before, mm-hmm. um, and 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 that's not to say that you have tunnel vision or anything right. like that. Right. But right. when you're talking about engaging a target and knowing the range and where to aim and all, that becomes second nature, right. and you right. you do it so much and so repeatedly. It's like it's like walking into your bedroom and turning on the 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 light. You don't have to look at the light switch to turn it on. You can walk into your room and just hit the light switch without looking at it because you've done it so many times. <laughs> Uh, 27th Indiana that made that utterly suicidal charge on July 3rd in the Spangler Meadow and the one of the survivors who wrote the regimental history and in fact you can go out and see the, the marker that the veterans placed and he describes the color guard and he said when the color guard got within probably a little more than 100 yards or so Confederates he said unleashed one of those perfectly timed volleys 
He said it was if a great chasm opened up mm. and the color guard of the 27th Indiana vanished, disappeared. Now, mm. it gets back mm. to your issue about training, Colby. He said, and what did the men do? They realigned the ranks. They dressed the ranks and then pushed forward. Just go forward, yeah. Right. They didn't scatter. They didn't race forward. They did what they were trained. Yeah. Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., after Fredericksburg, his father wrote a piece, I think it was published, in which he claimed that the northern side would win because the northern side was the moral side, that that would decide the day. And Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., would suffer no fools. So he wrote back to his father, castigated for this, how naive and silly he was. And he said, what's going to win this war? And you know, remember, this is the dude who had survived the horrible uh, uh, annihilation of Sedgwick's division at Antietam. That's right. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. He, he wrote his dad after Fredericksburg and he said, this is about training and basically professionalism. Yeah. Right? That's ultimately what's going to win this war. Let's not kid ourselves that somehow idealism, it's going to help, it's going to matter, sure. but it's not going to win the thing. No. Right? So, uh, Brian, thank you for the call. I love you. <laughs> we love you too. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um uh, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We'll take a, a quick break, and this is the quicker break here, and um, we will come back, and um, what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to go over some of the comments that people have made about uh, Pete and how wonderful he is, and then we'll get to a little bit of news, and uh, we will close the show, okay? so. And then uh, th maybe we'll talk a little bit about our experience uh, at Scott Hartwig's sure, uh, book. And then Mikey, Mikey Lentz is here. He hasn't been here in a while. We'll bring him in to the studio to say hi as well. So we'll be right back. Your Gettysburg business? Send an email to sales at addressinggettysburg.com. <laughs> Want the freshest cup of coffee in Gettysburg? Then visit Bantam Roasters, formerly 82 Cafe at 82 Steinware Avenue. They roast all of their coffee in-house, and they have a full coffee bar to keep you caffeinated during your trip. Visit them at www.raggededgerc.com for their menu and shipping options for all of their freshly roasted coffee. Use promo code HANCOCK for 10% off your order in the cafe. Enjoy historical stories on the History Fix platform. Explore movies, short films, and documentaries. Addressing Gettysburg podcast fans receive an extra $5 off the first year's annual subscription. Sign up at HistoryFix.com and use promo code Gettysburg. Every subscription includes a seven-day risk-free trial. Escape into history with History Fix. This episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you in part by me, audiobook narrator Mike Scott. Narrator of Savas Beatty's Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864, and, unlike anything that ever floated, The Monitor and Virginia and the Battle of Hampton Roads. If you are an author or publisher interested in having your titles produced as audiobooks, or even just in learning more about the process, give me a shout. You can find my contact info on my website, mikescottvoice.com. That's mikescottvoice.com. The 1863 civilians of Gettysburg were reluctant witnesses to the great battle. Join Ken Rich, the man in the red shirt, for his historic town walking tours. You could book these tours by emailing ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. That's ken at gettysburgtownhistory.com. And when you're in town, look for the guy in the red shirt. And Civil War Trails. It's the world's largest open-air museum, and they offer over 1,300 sites across six states. Drive the Gettysburg Campaign turn by turn, paddle to Frederick Douglass's birthplace, or hike to remote earthworks and artillery positions. Visit CivilWarTrails.org to request a brochure and explore their interactive map. Follow Civil War Trails and create some history of your own. You're listening to the Addressing Gettysburg Podcast with Matt Callery. Seems like we haven't seen you in forever. Welcome back to Addressing Gettysburg Today. Here's Matt. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. 
So we had uh, fun uh, yesterday. I really had a good time. Sorry, wait, hold on. Got so many sliders here, I can't keep track of what's what. And then mine was way up high. Okay. Um, yeah, we had a lot of fun yesterday. We went to, uh, what's the name of the place? McClinic Distillery. Yeah, Distillery. Or McClintock, McClintock Distillery. McClintock. McClintock. Which was a really cool place. I don't know what that building originally was, but it was pretty Someone neat. Someone said it was an auto body kind of place. Oh, really? Really? I forget. Oh. I forget who was saying it. I was one of your, one of the, um, when we first walked into the, the first bar we walked into, it was one of those three guys. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That was uh, either it Jake Wynn or. It wasn't the one that's sick today. And it wasn't, that's Rich Condon. It wasn't the guy that's in the Army Reserve. That wasn't the tall one. All right, so it was Jake. Okay. Jake yeah. who said it. He, yeah. he was telling me that it was something like an auto repair or an auto body shop back in the day. But that makes sense. It's super cool, man. That was, I've never, I'm, you know, my wife and I go down, we, I was telling you, we go down there, I don't know, I, every month and a half, two months, to go right. out for like dinner and, you know, have a nice night. And uh, I didn't even know that existed. That place was nice. I, I told her, I was like, we're going to have to go there when next time we come down. Yeah, no, it was pretty neat. Yeah, I, I so really liked if it. You, if you go, I, I got the gin there, the gin. In fact, I bought a bottle. Did you? It was so good. See, I can't yeah. do gin. Oh, I love gin. Uh, but they told me they don't serve food. But so, Colby, we should, this will be date night. I hate to say date night. If you say date night, it's pretty lame. Well, I think that your marriage is headed south, right? Uh, you're yes, trying to yes, recapture yes, something. Yes, so yes. I don't say date night. Right. But, Colby, we could take our wives and get some hamburgers and then go over and yeah. get some gin. That would be fun. Yeah. That's good. I'd be up for that. No, seriously. Yeah. I, I really so, I guess, Cindy, that. I guess you and I have to be married in order to get an invite to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with Cindy. It's just you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that was good. Come. That was quick. <laughs> that was pretty good. Um, uh, yeah, no, but it was really cool though. It was really fun. It was really nice to see everybody too. You got up and you you introduced Scott. You gave a little speech. I thought, I thought, I thought you did things. great too. Kissing his that, ass. I thought it was great though. I thought you did a very good job. Nice I mean, yes. Because I did. You get the opening was a little rough. I sort of insinuated that I had a private meeting with his wife Barbara. Which I, I missed said, that. Well, I said, and Barb and I were together. I was like, there's got to be a better way of saying that. <laughs> so I stepped back from that a little bit. And I also thought it was a nice touch. So, Colby, thank you for the compliment. When I, so I was a, for people at home, uh, when you submit a manuscript or a book to an academic press, they send that manuscript out to readers, and the author does not know. He has no idea who's reading the manuscript. So you read it, you make comments and observations. Yes. So I wrote my report. I, of course, endorsed Scott's book. Yesterday, I quoted myself, and I came home and told my wife, and yeah. she said, that's pretty obnoxious even by your standards. <laughs> <laughs> I said, because I forget. That's why I did it. Son of a bitch. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you got up there. You, uh, I, I liked how in the beginning you, you, you talk it in the mic and you take it away from your mouth. And you're like, oh, sh do I even need this? And everybody's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's this like big old brick warehouse with very, very high ceilings. You can't hear shit in that I, room. I didn't need it. I even with a microphone, I you couldn't make out things. It was tough. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Scott, though, for those uh, you know, who have not been on a Heart Week tour. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, you got to do it. We're taking a bus down there. CWI is to Antietam. There is Antietam. In a week, we sold it out almost instantly. He's that good. You get him on the battlefield here in Gettysburg. I he's, know. He's just he's he's great, and he's just such a wonderful person. We had him when they when they still had the adopt a position program, uh, and it was early on in our doing our tours, like you're going to be doing on Saturday. Um, I invited him to come and talk about the 69th Pennsylvania because that was one of our monuments. Yeah. And he came out and he gave a really awesome tour. Everybody loved it. And it's just, there's something about Scott that when he talks, you listen. Yeah. Right? Yeah, He's got a very yeah. relaxed approach. To yes. It, but it's like, yeah. it keeps your attention. It's not lazy. Yeah. It doesn't right. put you to sleep. Yes. He, it's almost like he's got this, uh, he knows it's, you can tell it's because he knows it so well. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, right. there are no nerves fluttering his, his you know, the way he's yes. portraying it. It's he can smooth. just relax and tell the story. Yeah. And uh, and it's very it seems like it's coming off the cuff. I got to tell you though, it is it is it's still surreal to me. You know, I was there last night, and um, you know, I, I know Scott, uh, I know you, but I know I knew both of you from TV first, from watching shows with you guys. You know, on there as Talking Heads, 
and and it still is weird to socialize with you guys or have you come on the show or something like that and because you know you know you're used to seeing somebody in that little box you know and right right, right. and right. then uh, and you with your scarf. <laughs> on TV, I and... wear a scarf on Saturday. I wasn't intending to, but I, no. Uh, please, I will, I'm telling uh, everybody that's everyone. coming to wear the scarf. You know, so uh, let's go into some of the uh, the comments here that uh, some people have been saying. Uh, can I say one thing about Scott yeah, real quick? Go ahead. So, at Gettysburg College, there used to be a Civil War semester, and people, students from across the country, would come to Gettysburg. The curriculum, obviously, would be mostly Civil War. For a variety of reasons, the program eventually ended. But when it was going, uh, Scott Hartwig was, this is like 25 years ago, he was one of the lead tour guides, right? Mm -hmm. He was incredibly pop popular, especially with the young women. They had <laughs> pictures of Scott Hartwig on their dorm walls. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I hate it when historians are objectified. Yes. yes. It is. <laughs> because it happens, happens so often. often. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a professor in college who was very similar. He was very good at what he did, but he was also very good looking. Yeah. And his office windows faced the windows of a dorm. Uh -oh. And one year... <laughs> Someone got like their entire floor that faced his office to spell out "I heart Sechi" <laughs> facing his office. He was. I asked him about it. He goes, "I don't want to talk about it." <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, Kevin Tracy says, "Vanished like a fart in the wind" is from the Shawshank Redemption. I knew it was from when something. Andy was found missing from his cell. Was that a Morgan Freeman line? No, it's the prison guard. Ah, uh, no, it's the. Uh, it might be the warden. warden. He the throws warden. The, he throws that warden. rock through the. Yeah. The, paint, the picture, yeah, yeah. and he says, like, what did he up and vanish like a fart in the wind? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, okay, so let's see here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm looking to see here. One of the most popular YouTube shorts is Peter Carmichael talking about the veterans returning to the battlefield. He's such a star. That's from Heinous and Nene 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 Nene. Nene. <laughs> I, I don't know what that's supposed to be, but I, that's what I call him or, or her. I don't even know. Is it he or she? I don't know. It's hey, it's H E Y N S E N E N E. What is that? Heinous and Nene Nene. -ne. That's what I call him on the show. Um, uh, let's see. It was a cold night. Oh, no, that's different there. And then. La, 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 la. Um, Lewis, we're, Mike Lentz, you're talking about Lewis. Oh, you and Estella talking about Lewis. Um, Stella says, Lewis reads and makes people cry. That's true. Because he cries. And that, of course, when you see a grown man cry, yeah. it makes you want to cry. Uh, Mike Lenz says, he made me cry at the Willard's Brigade tour. He also, I remember... Uh, when uh, he had everybody read something and Estella started crying in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. It's like when you see, ladies and gentlemen, you got to come out on our tours because Lewis does such a great job. We try to really put you in touch with the ground that you're standing on and the story that unfolded there. And sometimes he'll make you get up and he'll make you read about a soldier that died or, or you know, was wounded or whatever the case may be on the spot where it happened. And if that doesn't move you, then you ain't got no soul. Um, <laughs> Bunch of Robert Johnson running around. <laughs> Mike uh, also said Daniel's Brigade this year was an experience. That I think I'm still drying out from that one. We got rained on there. Um, let's see. the one where we got hailed on? Say what now? Well, last, last year. year. Oh, that was last that April. Was, uh, Kershaw's Brigade. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mike. I didn't have your mic on there. Sorry. Yeah, that was Kershaw's Brigade. Yeah. Um, good night to all and hello at Anderson. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Hit the like button. Yes, hit the like button. Hit the like button. All right. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, let's see. That means that the next thing we have to do is this. You doing news or events first? She's the gal who knows what's going on. So take notes. There's a test at the end. Here's AG Today's lead anchor, no. Veronica Brestensky, with news, traffic, weather, sidewalk conditions, and oh. what's happening this weekend. I must have all possible information. Avril f his men elegantly. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, old, there's man. a swamp dragon. <laughs> no, it really doesn't ever get old, does it? <laughs> oh, I could listen to that all day and I'd be laughing all day long. I know. <laughs> 
It's pretty good. All right, so Veronica is not here, um, but uh, Debbie has some stuff. Is, it, is this well, news I, or I, events, really? I was going to say more events oh, because oh. I was not prepared yeah. for the news this weekend, part. Where the action is. What's there to do and see when you're in town this weekend? Here's Valerie and Veronica to fill you in. It's all covered. <laughs> this is just an education guess. <laughs> <laughs> he said education worth Chattanooga. <laughs> All right, so go ahead, Debbie. What do you got going on? Is this uh, is this uh, is this fact or is this a hypothesis? These are facts. These are these are facts. Okay, good. (laughs) Go ahead. What do you got? As far as I'm aware, they're facts. Um, anyway, it is apparently a super busy weekend here in Gettysburg. It really is. It's like everybody, every museum has something going on. Um, but one of the biggest ones being this is World War II weekend out at the Eisenhower. Ah, yes. Um, so starting tomorrow night at the Visitor Center is a keynote address at 7 o'clock. Craig Simmons. Um, it's free, but you have to get the tickets through the Foundation website. <clears throat> All right, so um, okay, so there's I'm assuming still tickets available then. As far as I'm aware, I don't okay. Know. Um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday there is a World War Tour two tour of the National Cemetery at six o'clock. Nice. Um, Who's leading so, that? Do we know? It didn't say. Okay, so. that's okay. It's all right, Demi. It's um, okay. <laughs> Saturday, <laughs> nine to five. Sunday, nine to three. There will be living history out at the farm. Um, and there will be also uh, exhibits in the visitor center. Oh, cool! And Saturday, apparently, the American Experience Museum is doing a USO style swing dance. Very nice. Yeah, Cindy, you want to go to that? <laughs> she she doesn't laughed. care. She doesn't. Care. <laughs> <laughs> she just laughed. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's that's the World you War II assholes. weekend. Assholes. Um, oh, jeez. Uh, important. Uh, pavement updating. Oh, yes, This is please. not the sidewalk conditions, sadly. <laughs> However, mm. um, the next round of repaving the roads in the park uh, started this week. September 12th to October 6th, West Confederate Avenue is open with flaggers. So... So, in other words, they'll do like half yeah. half the road and then flag you around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there'll be temporary closures of Burdan and the Virginia Memorial loops. Okay. Uh, on the 14th, oh, well, I guess that would be today, um, from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., West Confederate Avenue is completely closed between the Millerstown Road and the Emmitsburg Road. Oh, near the Long Street Tower. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Um, but I, I got to say, though, there, because I drive around the battlefield every morning, and they're really getting this done quickly. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, like two days Three days tops on one strip of road, and then it's done. It's done, yeah. yeah. It feels nice when you're oh, out there. Yeah. So nice and smooth on the tuchus. <laughs> <laughs> and you would know, seeing as you're out I, there I, all, all the time. time. I'm driving around. I'm like, oh, this is so nice and smooth. Um, and then between the 12th and the 29th of September are all the day one roads. Sporadic closures right. from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. They've, they've started a little bit on day one. Yeah. Yeah. So, but all of them will be closed. And when was that? The 16th? Uh, it says the 12th to the 29th. 12th of to September. the 29th. So okay. sporadic. Okay. Um, but again, it's overnight. It's 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So it's not going to affect too much. Have you seen, and this is for anybody, uh, have you seen, you know, people complaining online about the closures and saying, now, well, well, if they're going to close Ayers Avenue, well, I'm not coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not coming to Gettysburg. <laughs> Why, you love going on Ayers Avenue? I don't know where it is, but, you know, if I can't access everything, <laughs> right. you know. Right. <laughs> I haven't seen it much lately. Yet, yet they're the yeah. same people that would bitch and moan and say the Park Service does nothing if we had potholes and the, right. the roads needed paving. Oh, yeah. So you just can't win with these people. I'm <laughs> telling you. They complain to complain. I would not want Steve Sims' job. No. No. That no, is no, no, that no, is like no, such a thankless job, and and it sucks because he does. I think he's doing a great job. Have it's you, a hard job to do. Have you been to Little Round Top yet? Have you seen that? Is it open? Well, I got to you, see it in June. If you're connected. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you for paying attention to our YouTube channel back in April when I did a live stream from there with Steve Sims, <laughs> and we're doing another one at the end of October. <laughs> so yes, I have been up there. Yeah. What do you think? 
I think people are going to like it. Uh, that's brilliant. It is, and I think the people who are who who were you know pissed about it closing are going to be like, I don't even remember what it looked like beforehand, but this is beautiful. You know, I mean, first of all, I don't know how many times I've twisted my ankle up on that. Ra- <laughs> and you, Mike, have you? I mean, you you're the ankle twister of this room, so probably somewhere along the line. You I had know. to, right? I'm nearly as yeah. bad. I face planted up there over a tree. So. <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, it was. Year, a year ago, I tried to step over a fallen log, and I went right down uh-huh. onto my face. See, it's not going to happen now anymore, because there are nice paths that they're making. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think people are going to like the retaining wall around the 44th New York. Oh, yeah. Because they, in doing that, yeah. they uncovered the original ground that the soldiers actually yeah. fought on. Yeah. So that's pretty neat. So you're gonna, there's new things that you're going to see there, ladies and gentlemen. And there's improved things that you're used to, right? right? Mm -hmm. Nothing is drastically different, only better. Better. Honestly, Mm -hmm. like, I think better. Well, you see rock walls that you never really have seen before, Yeah. right? Yep. And let's not forget, and it's preserving the landscape. Right. Like, (laughs) you can get as fussy as you want, but do you really want this thing to melt away? Right. Of course, if they don't do these things, it's going to do... You know, irretrievable damage. Yeah. And they've done it. And, of course, he has to take all kinds of heat for it. But I, I'm impressed. For example, he's smart enough to do a live stream with you. To like, He wants to be completely transparent. Here's Say that again. He's smart enough to do. <laughs> Say it again. Smart enough to invite you for a live stream. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Just, just, so, just in case he forgets that Are he's you? smart enough to do that. Now, <laughs> now uh, about a year ago... <laughs> I was walking around Culp's Hill, and they had a bunch of trees marked off down there. Are they doing mm-hmm. anything down there, too? Well, they cleared uh, the underbrush in front of uh, part of Green's Brigade. Um, and uh, But I don't know. Have they maintained that? I haven't really. I mean, it is well, sort of so maintained. It looked like they were getting ready to rebuild yeah. earthworks or something. So they do have a well, little bit were. of a trail, right? Yeah. They have a little bit of a trail, and they have a new interpretive marker for Forbes Rock. That's right. right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, that was the intent. Uh, and it, uh, though it just again illustrates the challenge of managing this place. Yeah. As yeah. soon as you cut it, right? It's like grows back. It's, it's like back. Yeah. It. It's, terrible. it's like weeds. Bring in the goats. <laughs> Bring in the goats. Seriously. Bring they, in the goats. You know, I, Sims addressed that. I was with him, and someone said, "Hey, use goats." And he had a number of reasons as to why. I know. It wasn't practical. But he has but, a number of reasons why we can't open the park until ten o'clock there during the summer. But I'm gonna I'm gonna break them down, and I'm gonna get him to change it. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> How cool would that be, though, if I could just convince him? Maybe just on anniversary weekend. Maybe we'll start small. Wait, what do you want? I don't understand. The park hours in the summer used to be until 10 p.m. Right. We're not there. Now it's sunset. 30 minutes past sunset. Well, yeah. that's your buffer. Technically, yes. it's sunset. Right. And then they give you a little bit of a buffer. And I, Cam got yelled at. Our friend Cam got yelled at because he was there past sunset walking and some uh, law enforcement rangers were hanging around his car when he got back to the car. And he's like, what gives? And they're like, well, what are you doing? It's, it's you know, we're closed. And he said, uh, well, I, I thought it was, you know, sunset. And they're like, yeah, it's sun, the sunset half hour ago. And, he, and mm. in his mind, sunset is as long as there's light, right. it's still sunset. That's not the reality. But that's technically, yeah. that is not true. It's when the sun is no longer visible, then that's sunset. And the light is just to help you get your ass out of the park. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, when they changed the hours, I was like, you know, I, every time I see Steve, I'm like, yeah, please, can we just, you know. Give us so, another hour. Because it's, because it's. It's, 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 there's something, you've been out there at night, I'm sure, right? Of course. Okay, it's different, right? There's some, there's a magic to it. And I think people need to experience that because that only helps you, uh, you know, if you're interested in this stuff already, that's great. Going to the battlefield, that's great. But then you go there at night and it's a different thing. Especially if you go out to Culp's Hill uh, for the uh, night fighting out. That. Yes, 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 yes. Good point. You can't really understand that if you don't get a chance to be out there at night. I was seasonal at uh, Fredericksburg, uh, the seasonals we gather at Spotsylvania. And we would walk from the Landrum house following the second corps attack toward the mule shoe. And 
obviously it'd get a little cooler at night if you got lucky it'd be just a little bit of mist maybe a little right, bit of right, fog right man. and of course we were abusing the uh, park regulations with impunity uh but well. we knew that if we got caught they couldn't fire us they needed us as seasonals and uh, <laughs> you got them would, by the balls would, of course we were so nerdy and there was a reason why we got few dates we would charge the mule shoot I mean, these are college age men oh no exactly <laughs> It's like, oh, yeah, we did that, and then we went home and played Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, so, my God. No, we didn't do Dungeons and cool. Dragons. Cool. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right, what else you got? Okay. Um, there will also be living history out on the field this weekend. Um, down at Spanglers, there's a group called Squabblers Mess. They're a non-firing, so they don't have specific program times. They're just there 9 to 5, 9 to 3 on the appropriate days. Um, but out at Pitzer's Woods is the 2nd Battalion, Army of Northern Virginia. They have Saturday, they have a program at 11, 1, and 3, and Sunday at 11 and 1. So they are a firing demonstration. So if you want to hear the things go boom, <laughs> go out to Pitzer's Woods. There you go. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. Oh, a couple more. Um this is Seminary Ridge. This is their legacy weekend. That's right. So. Oh, yes. And then tomorrow night, I'll be hosting a panel with... Is that uh, free or is that part of the... Um, I think you had to get tickets and I believe it's all yeah. sold out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, okay. a, it's a nice, intimate little gathering in the pavilion. It's going to be outside. Nice. Um, it's, it's so intimate. Not even, we're not even using microphones. We're just going to talk. Ooh. We're going to talk. And, uh, and that'll be nice. We're talking about the 151st Pennsylvania. The school teachers, teachers regiment. Is it school teachers with an apostrophe S or an S apostrophe or no apostrophe? Don't do this to me. Man. I'm terrible. <laughs> He's at that. a history professor, no not an English professor. No apostrophe. My, my so plural school teachers. Yeah, it's let's okay. just go with that. Got it. All right. That's what Pete's going with. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, if you do not have tickets to Matt's event tomorrow night, there is over at the Adams County Historical Society. The other Gettysburg podcast, oh. the Battle of Gettysburg podcast, oh, is no. doing a talk with Tim Smith on Lincoln at Gettysburg. Wait, hold on. Your, your, your mic keeps... Bu- bu- <laughs> <laughs> what, what's wrong with your microphone? <laughs> Debbie, Debbie, we can't hear you anymore. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, 7 o'clock. You do need tickets for that, but I don't, I don't think it's sold out because it was still coming up on there. Um, also, yeah, so our, our thing starts at 530. There's like a reception, food, oh. all that stuff. Oh. And then our show starts at 7 as well. There okay. Our, our not show, um, but our panel. And then also at the Adams County Historical Society oh. is Sorry. Um, on Saturday is Eisenhower in Gettysburg at 1 o'clock. Who's so. doing that? I did not or see is it just doing like, that. Is it I think that might or? be one of their like regular talks that they do, but okay. it fits in so nicely with World War II weekend that I figured I'd mention it. And speaking of news, uh, is that all you have? That's all I got. All right. And then the other thing, as far as show news goes, uh, the first episode of That's What She Said came out this uh, week. And uh, everybody, so far, the girls are getting really, really good reviews um, over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. I made it available for all levels of patron uh, of patrons uh, this month. Next month, it will be available exclusively for the second lieutenants and above. But I wanted you all to get a taste of it in case you wanted to uh, upgrade or just know what you're missing. And um, so that they did a really good job with that. It's about Elizabeth Thorne, one tough gal. That Elizabeth Thorne. You know her, Peter, right? I do not, no. Come on, Peter. I'm sorry, I don't. This is, wow. I Pistol Pete surprised. Carmichael sorry. disappointing us on so. major levels here. Yeah, she was she was the caretaker of the cemetery during the battle. Six months pregnant? Yep. Whoa. That's the story. Six months pregnant, dug a, almost 100 graves. And, uh, yeah. She back to a destroyed house. Back to a destroyed house. and Had small children already on top of that. <clears throat> right. And I don't think her, did her, ba- her baby didn't live too long, though, mm-hmm. after birth, right? Apparently no. it was always sickly, so. Maybe mm-hmm. because of the digging of the graves. We don't know. We just don't know that at all. But, you know. There's all kinds of wise tales out there. Well, that's true, Cameron. So Indeed. it could not be because of that. We don't know. Um, and so, anyway, everybody that listened to it and, and had nice things to say, thank you very much. The girls are... The girls don't realize how good they are. 
And uh, you know, they're all like, "Oh, I don't know." Oh. And they were that they were that way from the very beginning. And I said to them, "No, no, no, you're you're good. Like this is why I'm asking you to do it because you're good, you know." Yeah. Um, and uh, I think now they're starting to realize, well, maybe we are kind of good, you know. Well, they, they're, the head's growing a little bit, huh? Not yet, not oh, yet. Okay. But right. they're, no, they're just you know they're getting up to a healthy ego. Their confidence, not ego. Confidence. Yes. yes thank you. Thank you. Healthy confidence. And that's about it for that uh, for me here. And uh, Mike, okay. by, uh, welcome in. And just real quick, how are you doing? You you last time we saw you was prior to your accident back in what June, yes. right? Yeah. In you May. are uh, healed. I'm fully healed from my spinal fracture. Yeah. And good, good. Yeah. And uh, you still got to get a car. No, oh, yeah. Because you totaled your yeah. car. Yeah. yeah. But I'm, at least I'm alive. That's what At matters. least you're alive, yeah. 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 He, he went mm-hmm. off a cliff, Pete. Jesus. <laughs> off a cliff. Like <laughs> Thelma really. Louis style. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Decided I to mean, jump up Nissan Rogue. It, it did not end very well for me. Uh, the Nissan Rogue. Yeah. <laughs> no, but what, what what happened? You want to tell everybody what happened? We didn't. Yeah. We, didn't we didn't tell uh, it because we thought it was your business to tell. I was uh, burning the candle at both ends. I fell asleep at the wheel. Mm-hmm. Oh my! Veered off. Have pulled. you ever met anybody who's fallen asleep at the wheel? Well, Pete, we've all dozed. From we've all dozed, time. but I mean, falling asleep. I fell asleep, asleep at a stoplight on base one time. <laughs> well, that, but you were stopped. But you I stopped. was, but I wasn't in park, and I woke up. Thank God, oh. with my foot still on the brake. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and a right. green light. Yeah. So, but go ahead. so I woke up, and I just felt the car just poof off of a little berm. I overcorrected right into like a hill. Bam. Mm. And yeah, if I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. I wouldn't dead. be here. Yeah. I'd be dead. Really? Yeah. It was that hard. It was that hard. and it, You didn't roll, did no, you? No, no. I yeah. didn't roll. Just but smashed. Smashed in. And that bump over the berm that I actually got air off of, I would have, if I didn't have my seatbelt, I would be going through the windshield. You would have hit. Oh, my God. Enough. At least my head would have gone into the windshield. And uh, oh, I'm just, I'm lucky just to have a spinal fracture out of all Yeah. I'll say. Yeah. So, yeah. I remember that day we were we were getting ready to start doing one of these shows back at the old studio, and you called me, and you said, uh, "Hey, so I just totaled my car," and I'm like, "Okay, really? Are you all right?" And yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Do you wanna? What do you wanna do? Just talk or like what? Do you need me to do something? You know, yeah, still, no, I just need shock, somebody yeah. to talk to. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then there was, thank God, there were, I heard a voice in the background. He's like, do you want me to call an ambulance? And at first you said no. And then you go, ah, you know what? Maybe, maybe, yeah. Maybe we <laughs> 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 and I was like, okay, he's, and then I, I, I let Debbie know and you went and helped him. You went to the ER, right? Oh, and, absolutely. Picked yeah. him up from the ER, from the ER. Took him home. Did you have a concussion? Uh, no, I did not. I did not. You hit were my just head. in shock. Yeah, I bruised my, um, you know, the, I call it the Hancock bone. Yes. I bruised that, and I your uh, Hancockics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and the fractured my spine, my lumbar spine, and uh, that was. Did ooh. this happen in Gettysburg? Uh, this happened about ten miles north. Twelve miles. Oh, north. ten miles. I thought for some reason I pictured yeah. it closer to town. Uh, I was I was coming down to do some research at ACHS and I fell asleep at the wheel. Boom. At 15? No. No, no, I was coming down from Carlisle. Biglerville uh, Road. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I just So this was be, uh, above Biglerville? This was uh, or just below it. It might have just been just above Biglerville. Yeah. Above yeah. yeah. Wow. So it was uh I, again as I said, I, it hurts, you know, physically and it hurts emotionally not having the sure. car, but when I look at everything and I weigh everything, uh, yeah. I, I came out all right. Now, did the people that came to help you? Did they recognize you from the show? Oh no, no. Oh. But those 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 people were champs. They were the farmers that, or people who lived out there, and they in just the came. They came running. Yeah. And, and well, sure. And they they saw it. I was in shock. I couldn't really process much of anything. Yeah. And they were the ones who were like, "Here, here, have a bottle of water. Here, you know, let's call the ambulance. Here, right. you know." Right. Making sure everything was, right. and so to them, I'm really indebted because they yeah. they Saved came through. Life, man. Yeah. Were they Amish? No. Okay. No. Good. No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Am I good? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, who knows? <laughs> because the Amish wouldn't have had okay, a phone. Good. They wouldn't have had good. a phone right. exactly. So and Mike was on the phone with me. They didn't want to interrupt the conversation. <laughs> so these are the people that had their phone. Thank God. But I'll be. Uh, this will be the first get out of the car tour that I'm going to be attending. Yes. No, it um, isn't. Oh, since since the since that one, since that one, because you came like the two days later. Yeah, two we days had the later, tour. Yeah. But 
I was like, I can do this. This is fine. And then I got home and I went, no, this is not yeah. fine. You have a spine fracture. What are you? I didn't know about the spine fracture until the next week. No, you did. No, you knew. I, I kind of had a pain. I kind of understood that there was a problem. But then... no, no, no. The night you're, of, yeah, you had you're... the report. You read it to me on the phone. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. It made <laughs> you laugh. Yeah, they they said it was a spine fracture. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but but no, I mean. That tour and, and doing that, it convinced me that I needed to take my time and just heal. Yeah. yeah. And so I've been out for months, but I'm, I'm good right now. Good. All right. Good. I'm glad. P. Carmichael, thank you very well, much. Pistol you. P. Carmichael, Appreciate ladies it. and gentlemen, come Appreciate catch it. him on uh, Saturday on our tour. Uh, Colby, thank you. Debbie, thank you. Mikey, thank you. Pete, thank you. Everybody who called in, thank you. And uh, we'll see you on Saturday. Don't forget to wear your scarves, because if you don't, we're kicking you out. Goodbye. Addressing Gettysburg Today is produced by Matt Callery and Veronica Prestensky Esquire and broadcast from the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios. Engineered by Colby Sumner and sometimes someone else. Guest accommodations are provided by the guests themselves, who are waiting Vanderbilt. But if you want us to take better care of them, become a patron at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. I'm Huevos Grande, the voice of Addressing Gettysburg. Thanks for listening. Will you get out of here? So we made a thoroughhead for freedom in the train. 60 miles of ladder to 300 to the main. Wow! Wow! Well, that happens to coincide with my shitting my pants story. This concludes our broadcast day. I just hate you, and I hate your ass face!